meeting to order for Monday, August 3rd. Hope everybody's been well. Um, obviously, first thing to do is to approve the agenda. All the board members see the agenda and anybody else that's joined us, if there's any uh, wishes or considerations to add or change the agenda. I a, Chris, I make a motion to uh, add on the agenda the item that Bill uh, suggested about um, extending the, um, the uh, recreation program by a few weeks. Thank you, Mike. I'll put that under our manager's items. Any other changes or additions? Okay, seeing none. Uh, I'd like to have somebody approve the agenda with the addition of the extending the, the recreation program. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with the change. I hear a second. Second. Any further discussion? All those who wish to approve, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Consent agenda items simply consist of minutes of uh, July 20th meeting and a liquor license for the old stagecoach in. There are a motion to approve that <coughs> consent agenda, please. Motion to approve that, please. Make a motion to approve that. Okay, second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Public. Is there anybody on joined us tonight that wishes to speak at this point? Have any comments or anything? Guess not. So we will proceed. A uh, little bit early, 708. The uh, item that's up now, regional concern meeting, uh, bridge 44 over the Little River. And uh, I think we have a few people here that will speak to that, but we'll let Bill kick it off as always. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, Laura Stone is here, I know from VTrans. I'm not sure who else. I imagine maybe Martha evans Mongen is here for this particular item as well. But uh, I think we'll just turn it over to Laura and let her talk about this. This is the Route 2 bridge that spans the Little River. Uh, and uh, it's in need of some upgrading. And it's been <clears throat> something that we've been hearing about for a couple of years now. And this meeting has been pushed off a couple of different times, but here we are. So Laura, why don't you take it from here and then you can introduce others who may be uh, on to assist you. Hi, thank you, Bill. So we have, um, Martha from Du Bois and King, and we also have Todd Subner from VTrans, who is the consultant project manager. I'll go ahead and share my PowerPoint here. Hopefully everybody can see this. So this is the regional concerns meeting, as you said, for Bridge 44 over the Little River. Um, again, we have Todd Subner here, uh, myself, and uh, Martha evans Mungin as well. So really the purpose of this meeting, we wanna provide an understanding of our approach to the project. We wanna provide an overview of project constraints, discuss our selected alternative, both for the bridge and for traffic control and provide an opportunity to ask questions and voice concerns. Here's a location map. The bridge is located just east of Little River Road. There's an aerial view. Um, so you can see Route 2 parallels I-89 right at that location. So I'm gonna go briefly over the the VTrans project development process, um, give the project overview, so the existing conditions of the bridge, um, environmental resources, we'll talk about the alternatives considered and our selected alternative. Um, we'll talk about maintenance of traffic, the schedule, so when you can expect to see this in construction. Uh, summary and questions, I'm happy taking questions either all at the end or if people have questions as they come up through the presentation, you can interrupt me as well. 
So here's our project development process. This slide is really just to show that the project's been funded. This isn't a really, project definition has been initiated. It's a really early um, stage of project development where we identify the resources, you know, the environmental and cultural resources, evaluate alternatives, uh, public participation, that's where we are right now. Um, we've finished a scoping report and now we want to build consensus for project that we've chosen. From here, the project will be defined. That's when we're going to quantify areas of impact. That's when we're going to develop plans, um, estimates, right-of-way process if needed. It's not in this um, for this bridge. Then we'll go on to contract award. And that's when the bridge will go into construction. So before I go on to the existing conditions, here's just a picture of some of the descriptions of the terms I'll talk about. Uh, the bridge deck is the part that you drive over. The beams are what hold the deck up. At each end of the beams, you will have, a, well, we, we call it a substructure or an abutment. That's really the supports for the bridge. And there's also intermediate supports or we refer to as piers. Here's a picture looking west over bridge 44. The road is classified as a major collector. It's a 243 foot long, uh, three span roll beam bridge constructed in 1961. It was repainted in 1984 and it's owned by the state of Vermont. So there's no local share for this project. Um, the deck, uh, the bridge deck is in poor condition. There's large delaminations and spalling throughout with scattered areas of saturation. That really just means that um, concrete's falling off of the bottom of that deck. Uh, there's exposed reinforcing steel. Um, the superstructure, the rolled beams have paint peeling, mostly along the flanges and the beam ends. So where there's, there's water leaking in through the joints. Um, there's heavy rust scale and minor to moderate section loss. The substructure, the abutments are in good condition. However, the piers, so those intermediate supports, those are in poor condition. So here's the condition ratings. You can see some of that spalling on the underside of the deck with exposed rebar. The deck is rated a four, poor. Superstructure or the beams are rated a six, satisfactory, and the substructure is rated a four, poor. Here's a picture of the eastern abutment. As you can see, satisfactory condition. The western abutment, again, there's not a lot of concrete coming off there. And there's the eastern pier. So you can see there's a lot of spalling along the, the pier cap or that top section of the pier. Again, the pier columns, you can see a lot of exposed rebar. Uh, resources, here's a picture looking downstream. This is an important wildlife corridor. There's wildlife cameras up all um, underneath the bridge. And there is a northern long-eared bat um, habitat, which really just restricts the time of year that we're allowed to do any tree clearing. Here's a picture of the existing condition. So the gray portion is, um, is bridge 44. Um, I would like to point out it's all state of Vermont right of way in all four quadrants of the bridge. Um, so no right of way will be needed. I'll also point out there's a utility line. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there is a buried conduit that's attached to the bridge and then it's buried um, to the north side of the bridge. So design criteria and considerations, there's an average daily traffic of 3,000 vehicles per day, a design hourly volume of 460 vehicles per hour. So that's the peak hour. Uh, percent trucks of 5.8, design speed of 50 miles per hour. Again, we do have underground utilities. It's a consolidated communications cable with a six inch conduit attached to the bottom of the bridge. And this is a high priority bike corridor. So the alternatives we considered, we looked at um, no action, obviously with the condition of those piers and the deck, something has to happen in the next 10 years. Uh, we looked at a deck replacement, uh, extensive repairs uh, would have to be made to the pier columns and the caps. 
Um, deck replacement would have an 11-4 typical section, which is currently what the existing um, typical section is. So those are two 11-foot travel lanes with four-foot shoulders on either side. Uh, the four-foot shoulder does meet the um, bike requirements. We expect about 30 years from a deck replacement. Next, we went, into, went on to a superstructure replacement. Again, extensive repairs um, to the pier columns and caps would be needed. Uh, new bearings and bridge seats. 11-4 typical for all of the, all of the um, alternatives that we looked at. And we'd expect, well, we say 40 here, but we'd really expect more 40 to 60 years for the superstructure replacement, talking about the, um, the repairs to the piers that we're gonna talk about. A uh, full bridge replacement on alignment, we'd maintain the horizontal alignment. Again, 11-4 typical section, and we would expect about 75 years um, out of a full bridge replacement. So what we selected here was a superstructure replacement. 11-4 typical meets, um, meets the minimum standard. It matches what's out there right now. Again, this says 40 here, which is typically for a superstructure replacement, but out of this structure, we're gonna talk about um, fully encasing the piers, possibly replacing the entire pier caps. So you could expect about 60 years before um, another project has to go through here. Again, no right of way will be needed. So here's a picture of the proposed typical section. This shows the two 11 foot travel lanes and the four foot shoulders required for shared use. The typical section of the roadway, very similar. And the proposed layout. And as you'll notice, this looks um, very similar to the existing conditions layout. The substructures and piers are going to remain and um, and a new superstructure, so no new beams and a new deck will be placed on the existing uh, supports. So Laura, real quick, um, my, one of the questions I was gonna ask was by uh, accepting the superstructure model, uh, you wouldn't be salvaging and reusing the current I-beams that are there then? No, we'd be replacing the beams. Um, so once you get into a deck replacement with just painting the beams, costs are pretty high just because of the late lead abatement. Um, painting beams is, is pretty high. Um, so it's actually uh, more cost effective sometimes to just take the, take the beams off entirely and replace them. Also by removing the beams that allows us to do all the work that we wanna do to the, the piers below. And what do you typically do with the discarded beams? Are those the contractor's property or? Todd, could you speak up to that? Is that, I believe it would be the contractors. I could be wrong there. Yep, uh, it took me a while to find the, the unmute button. I found it. Uh, yeah, no, it's gonna be the property of the contractor and they're, they're liable for disposing of it because it will have, it is expected for it to have lead paint on it. So they need to dispose of it properly. And there is some salvage value associated with that. So we'd expect that we would see kind of indirectly a credit back to the project through the bidding process. Thank you. So here's a proposed profile. So this is if you're looking at the side of the bridge or the fascia of the bridge. Um, the proposed profile is going to match existing. We're not talking about changing the grades at all. So the maintenance of traffic options considered. We looked at an off-site detour with accelerated bridge construction techniques. Um, we looked at phased construction, which would keep one lane of alternating traffic open during construction for an entire construction season. And then we considered a temporary bridge. So what we're proposing here is a two lane temporary bridge upstream. So that would be right in about that location right there between bridge 44 and the interstate. Um, we really felt with, um, with the state park there, with Fars Fields, with all the, 
the bicycle routes in the area. This is a backup route. If I if I-89 needs to be closed, they would be detoured onto Route 2. So we really felt that it was important to maintain traffic and maintain two-way traffic um, through the project area. Uh, again, no right-of-way will be needed as it's a state-owned land. Here's an upstream temporary bridge layout. This is very conceptual in nature. Um, it, it may be closer to the interstate bridge. These are really just conceptual plans. So currently this is in the project budget for construction in 2023. There's a total cost estimate of 4.6 million. That's with engineering costs, um, permitting costs, and construction costs. So a project summary, uh, we're proposing a superstructure replacement with traffic maintained on a two-way temporary bridge, 11-4 minimum typical section, uh, no right-of-ways needed. There will be a buried communications cable relocation and we expect this to be constructed in 2023. So that's the presentation. There is a link up at the top of the screen here. All future plan sets uh, will be posted to this link. Tonight's presentation will be posted to this link as well. Laura, Questions, uh, comments? Yeah, I had a question about um, the, the road that's there. The, um, what is that, Far Road? It's Far Road, correct. Will that, will there be any um, disruption of their access to the property? There won't be disruption. There may, um, I mean, when they're putting this, this approach in, there, it may be down to one lane, but we'll make sure that everybody, I know this is a, I believe it's a dead end road here. So yeah, we'll make sure. Dead end residential. Yeah, so we'll make sure that um, access is maintained at all times. Laura, how does the, um, the, the three alternatives was the deck superstructure and full replacement. How does the third uh, project differ from the other two? A full bridge replacement? Right. So with a full bridge replacement, the difference is that we would remove the existing abutments, we'd remove the existing piers entirely, and we'd put new supports. Um, we construct new supports under the new superstructure and deck. Okay, thank you. But in terms of what, what it looks like to the public, I mean, that would probably be very, very similar, um, same alignment, same width. It would just be the placement of, of the piers and the abutments that might change. Second, second question was, I know uh, I'm an angler, I communicate with the angling community. Little River is a, a fairly active between there and the dam. Will there be any disruptions to uh, fisheries population from this project? I don't believe there will be. A lot of the work is going to be out of the stream. Um, and we do have to abide by permitting. There's certain in-stream restrictions, time of year. So I wouldn't expect any, um, any impact to the fisheries. Okay, thank you. Yep. Laura, I did have one more question um, and I'm not sure if you can speak to this, but um, I forget how many years ago now it was, but we did the off-ramp project uh, at exit 10. Is this similar in uh, the level of um, the level of rebuilding of the bridge project uh, as as that was? I'm not sure that I'm a hundred percent aware of what what the exit 10 project entailed. I don't know if Todd is more familiar with that project. 
I'm um, just wondering more of like from a disruption standpoint and you know the, the the length of the project and the amount of noise involved because I I do remember um, you know we got quite used to being lulled to sleep by the sound of jackhammers for a couple of years there so yeah I don't expect that because this is there's a temporary bridge in place I wouldn't expect that the contractor would be working overnight um, again, we're maintaining two lanes of traffic. There aren't any ramps being closed or anything like that. Um, so there might be some disruption, like when they're, when they're switching traffic over from US2 onto the temporary structure, onto the temporary bridge. Um, but that should really be the most traffic impacts that we would see. Obviously there'd be construction vehicles entering and exiting um, and exiting the construction zone, but I don't believe that the impacts would be the same at all. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't expect the um, the the work to continue into the evening or anything. There's no reason. We're going to have a temporary bridge. You got one full. You'll have one full construction season to get the deck and the the, the new. Um, the new steel in there. So that's something that should be very deal doable versus. Uh, during normal working days. I don't know the contractor might do five eights or six eights working on Saturdays, or they might do 10 hour days. It, it all depends, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be any night work is not anticipated to be needed. Okay. Thank you. So I just have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. The length of time, so we say 2023, is this a year, two year, three year project? This should be a one year project. It's possible that the, con uh, that the contractor will wanna construct the temporary bridge um, in the fall ahead of time. Um, at this point, I, I'm not sure, but the actual construction of the bridge should be a one year project. But there won't be enough time for the people that live on that road to modify their travel plans if they need to. Because there are people that are from on either side of that far road that take that road to go to their houses. So they'll be inconvenienced yes. a little bit. Yeah, they should still be able to access um, go right or left off of far road um, from uh, onto the temporary approach. So I don't, I don't expect there to be, I don't think they're gonna be cut off from their properties or anything like that. You know, uh, the only thing I can think of is possibly uh, they're gonna have flaggers out there as they're taking truck deliveries for materials to, to do the fill or to put the temporary bridge in there. Um, launching it and stuff like that so th there may be some short-term <laughs> durations you know where they're just gonna you're just going to wait for the flag to turn the paddle around that says okay you can go slow now right yeah there there should not be a lot of disruption to local traffic there Laura, when you when you answered the question and said one year construction you really mean one construction season correct one construction season, like I said, they it hasn't been determined if the um, if the temporary bridge will be constructed the fall before. Right, but the construction of the temporary bridge, except for a little bit of disruption on Fire Road, really doesn't impact traffic at all. Not on Route Two, right? So I've got a few questions there. Uh, if nobody else has got anything to ask at this point or comment. Okay, so my first question is, uh, and I guess it's a, an assumption, uh, I'm assuming that the state looked at the possibilities of um, possibly on and off ramp off the interstate bridge to uh, or was that looked at, I guess, is my question, to uh, uh, prevent having to put in a temporary bridge? Um, I don't know if there's enough width on the interstate bridge. You'd have to take up probably in the shoulder and 
the shoulders in both lanes in order to access on one side and come out the other um, as opposed to putting in a temporary. And my next question kind of follows that. Uh, what was what would be the cost of the temporary bridge? And then um, then I was looking for cost difference between full reconstruction and the superstructure option. Yep. So information. I actually I do have this here. So here's the costs for for the different options. I don't know if you guys can see this little that out of the way. Um so the cost of a temporary bridge here is maybe five hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand. I mean it's it's cheaper to close or it's cheaper to phase can you know phase construction but we felt that a temporary bridge is really important here in terms of the ramps i'm not quite sure that i understand uh, what you were asking you were talking about ramps off of the interstate yeah i didn't know if there was a way of um, coming off from route 2 onto a section of the interstate you'd have to put up jersey barriers and split a section of the bridge probably narrow it down to one lane traffic from the interstate and would you still have room for two lane uh from a route two access on and back off uh kind of circumventing uh the project so i don't believe we'd have enough room for both interstate traffic and two lanes of route two yeah um I'm not sure that that would be cheaper. I, I would actually expect that to be more expensive than a temporary bridge option. Mm. I mean, a temporary bridge, a lot of contractors have them. They reuse them from place to place. Um, but it's it's a good idea. Well, I just, yeah. Just, yeah. just a question. Outside the box. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the cost difference between full reconstruction and superstructure option. Is... Yeah, so the cost difference, so 4.6 million is what we estimated for a superstructure replacement. Um, 7.3 million for a full bridge replacement. Almost double. Almost double. And again, like I said, I have 40 years there, but um, when when we discussed this internally, so what we're talking about doing to the peers is actually like encasing them. It's not just the typical, you know, take take the bad concrete off and put some patches on. Um, it's going to be a more robust repair. So we'd expect um, quite a bit more than forty years out of. And you can in, you can eliminate that internal rot um, when you encase something like that if you don't basically get all the infection out from the inside, um, what are the chances that it's gonna eat itself out from the inside? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so we currently, um, we've put in the request to do some concrete cores here. So they're gonna core the concrete at both the worst areas of the concrete and the best areas of the concrete, just to see what we're dealing with. If we're dealing with like alkali silica reaction, which we're, we don't expect here. They'll test um, the strength of the remaining concrete. They'll test um, the chloride content in the concrete. And so if those tests came back and it said, you know, this concrete is awful, it's chloride laced, it has ASR, um, we'd likely end up replacing the entire pierce. It's possible. Um, but based on, based on just a visual inspection of them and the inspector's notes, we don't expect that to be the case. Um, also, sometimes we'll put in, um, they look like little hockey pucks, um, but they, uh, Todd, could you help me out on what they're called? Steve? Well, like wafers type? Yeah, they're, they're a sacrificial thing. What happens is you put them, you can put them into the concrete, you tie them to the exi existing uh, rebar, and it kind of draws 
Uh, and I, don't, I know I can never get them right if it's cation or anion, but it draw it draws it together. It kind of draws it out, and they actually. I mean, I I'm I've been looking for an, uh, an excuse to use it on one of my projects, but um, it, it it may be just be surface concrete because what really is making those uh, that concrete look bad is all the leaking expansion joints. So it could be just surface. If it's more in depth than that. We'll consider using something like hockey pucks. If it's even worse than that, where we don't think that they're not that they're not going to work, like Laura said, we'd be going just we'd be just replacing it. But one of the things is um, with the new deck um, and replacing the steel, they're going to be continuous continuous uh, girders, so there won't be any more expansion joints over those piers. So if we can just get that fixed up, it's going to be protected a lot more moving forward than it is right now. So now that I got you on the hook, Todd, you bring a question to mind. Um, okay. In the past, I've noticed uh, I have a uh, triaxle, Volvo triaxle that I drive on the interstate. And uh, some of the bridges that you encounter, um, the, the first joint and the last joint are horrible bumps. Um, and I know <laughs> that uh, there's been some work to improve that. Um, could you talk about that a little bit and the method that you guys are using these days? Well, a lot, a lot of the times, a lot of those bumps is the, the expansion joint is failing. You have a lot of, um, you, you got a lot of the, the concrete is rotting out around it. You're getting a lot of leakage. It's just, it's in rough shape. Um, in this particular case, you know, we haven't got into the, the, the great, you know, the details of it, because this is just still the alternatives. But once we get into the design, we're going to look and uh, just so you know, VTrans has, uh, uh, has um, uh, hired uh, Dubois and King off our retainer contract to do the design. So I'll be, we'll be working together on that. And we're going to move those expansion joints off the bridge. So they're not going to be on the bridge. Maybe they'll be at the end of uh, an approach slab or something like that. So um, it doesn't necessarily, and so it'll be a little bit easier to repair. There's going to be a different type of joint, possibly. Well, it looks like they've been using some form of a rubber compound to. Uh, yeah, that's an asphaltic band -aid plug joint. Get over those. What's that? That's they call that an as asphaltic plug joint. And those, um, they're relatively cheap, a lot more than trying to replace a, a finger joint bridge or a Vermont joint bridge. And it, you, you can keep replacing those every, every five years or whatever. I'm not sure what the lifespan on those things are. Uh, you can still replace those again and again. Uh, like when you do the paving, when they go through and pave the project, they can replace those asphaltic plug joints a lot cheaper. Thank you. But that doesn't necessarily, I mean, depending on the situation that, you know, it may be, like you said, it could be just a Band-Aid yeah. until um, the, the real problem is addressed. I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah. Thanks. Any I, other questions? Go ahead, Mike. I have another question. Uh, Route 2 is a fairly heavily used road. Uh, I know that's going to be a temporary bridge both ways what's going to be the um is there going to be any kind of uh weight restriction on that temporary bridge why that's being used i assume it would no that temporary bridge will be designed to carry all legal loads okay good that's good because the bolton pit is about the only game in town for a lot of contractors yeah there's well Another reason is is what happens when there's an inter, when there's an accident on the interstate? Where does traffic get detoured? Route two. So it's so we felt it was very important to have a two lane temporary bridge uh, to mitigate those 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 things or that possibility as well. Good question, Mike. Thanks. I have one more question. So on the off-site detour between alternative one and alternative two, it's not quite a million dollars, but you 
have the temporary bridge in there. So what is the difference in the cost between the offsite detours between alternative one and two? If you could elaborate, please. Can you repeat the question? So, you, so you're asking what the difference is between- Correct, because you both, you both have offsite detours for, for the expansion, alternative one and alternative two, there's a, a quite a cost difference, but you still have the temporary bridge in there. So I wanted to know what those costs were for the offsite detour. Yeah, so the offsite detour cost for alternative one, just a deck replacement, is 2.4 million. And in terms of costs of the actual detour piece, that's, um, you know, sign packages, um, that sort of thing. And then I for the super. That's a lot of money. Laura, I think, I think you need to explain that the costs there are the, are the product costs, right? Oh yes, this is this is if you're for going to build alternative one. It's just a decorative. If you do an offsite detour, the project is two point four million dollars. If you do a replacement and you use phase construction, the cost is three point two. It's not you know you, you don't add them all up. It's it's the cost of the project doing it with either A, B, or C in alternatives one, two, or three, right? Thank you, Bill. That's that's um, exactly right. So this is these are total project costs of the bridge, traffic control, permitting, um, construction engineering, um, engineering. Um, it's the total costs um, of the project. So the, the cheapest so the cheapest project is to do a deck replacement with an offsite detour. But they've determined that a deck replacement doesn't do enough for the bridge. It doesn't give, uh, you know, the quality product that they want. It doesn't give them a long enough lifespan than they want. So they move to alternative two, and then they look at the cost between the offsite detour, phase construction. But they've decided that a temporary bridge is necessary in order to keep traffic flowing and to to make the the project. Um, you know, take care of existing traffic as well as put a bridge in. So they have to look at all the different alternatives, but they've chosen alternative 2C as the optimum one. This is the one that gives us the best ability to maintain traffic as we have to maintain it, gives us the, the life expectancy for the bridge that we need and the safety. So, you know, you, it's kind of a cost benefit analysis and they're showing you here all the different costs with all the different benefits and they've chosen alternative 2C as the one to go with. Carla, do you still need the iPad identified? Yes, please. So the woman who just asked the question about the temporary bridge cost, can you identify yourself for record, please? Hi, this is Cheryl Glore. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I understand the concept. I just wasn't sure why the costs were different for, but anyway, but thank you. I appreciate it. Well, Bill, if there's no more questions from anybody, we can probably thank our guests for the presentation and uh, let them go for the night if they wish. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Martha. Thank you very much. Okay. So we can jump to our next item, which is the select board items. And uh, I actually changed that on my agenda to, to say speeding in Waterbury. <laughs> because we've had so many complaints and so many different roads in the town of Waterbury. It seems like this is just another one to add to the list. And this is specifically tonight, we'll be talking about Stowe Street. Um, and there's probably a few people here that uh, 
may have some comments pertaining to that. So go ahead, Bill, and uh, see where we go. Um, well, it's really not anything for me. I mean, you said it uh, quite clearly, Chris, that you know, speeding is an issue that we have um, not just in Waterbury. It's kind of a universal problem on on streets in in communities all over the country. I'm sure there's some people here that uh, asked for this to be on the agenda. I think you should you should hear them. Um, I will remind the the board, and uh, you know, maybe we need to get this fellow. Um, Mario Dupigny Giroux into a, a meeting uh, one of these times. This is the high risk rural road projects that we have um, pegged for both Guptill Road and Stowe Street. <clears throat> we talked about this a year ago when, when we had people on Guptill Road talking about speeding. And, uh, you know, Bill Woodruff and I told the board that <clears throat> we had this uh, pro this uh, project from the state, they were gonna do signage and some, uh, you know, other kind of traffic calming issues, not not speed bumps, not, not narrowing the roads at all, but we signed up for this, it's gotta be four years ago now, and Steve is here on the, on the, uh, on the Zoom and maybe he remembers, but I did ask Bill Woodruff to reach out to the VTRANS and find out you know, where these projects are. I sent that email out to the select board last week where he's indicated that they have uh, received some proposals from contractors, they're being evaluated in their hope that the project will be under construction later this year. Um, maybe we ought to have them back to remind us exactly what they're going to do. And maybe Steve remembers, but uh, it's a, it is very frustrating from my perspective that this is taking so long. Bill, I could just speak briefly to this before we open it up. If that would be good, Chris, you yeah, your call. Yeah, yeah absolutely, Steve. You know, fill us in if you've got any new sure. information. A absolutely. So uh, the High Risk Rural Roads Program is a program of VTRANS. Uh, Bill mentioned the engineer, Mario, who consulted with us. And uh, they came up with a scheme. Uh, the one project that was uh, a result of that was the radar speed sign that signs that um, have been installed at the foot of the hill, if you will, uh, coming down from Waterbury Stowe Road before you get to the uh, interstate bridges and East Street. And um, <clears throat> there, there were a number of other recommendations. Uh, one of them had to do with updating the school signage package and um, the, the warning signs and so on for the 25 mile an hour uh, speed zone, even though the whole street is 25 miles an hour, that's a special zone. So. There are uh, standards that um, the federal and state government have for these school zones. So Mario recommended uh, a new package that would add uh, safety and uh, warning signs and so on for that zone and presumably make it a little bit more enforceable. Uh, the other improvements that Mario recommended were more traffic calming improvements and uh, they were somewhat dependent on, on repaving Stowe Street it involved uh, line work to uh, put a special center line on the street to uh, help uh, define the lanes, help uh, reduce traffic. Um, I don't have the details right in front of me, but um, that repaving project uh, obviously hasn't occurred yet. So um, we put those improvements on hold. Uh, the signage package that Bill mentioned uh, is dependent on uh, funding through, uh, through VTRANS. It's, uh, I believe, 100% VTRANS funded. So there's a pool of projects that um, statewide, and they um, 
I think they issue a contract each year that packages a, a bunch of these projects to make it cost effective. Uh, Bill mentioned briefly Guptal Road. I won't go into details on Guptal Road, but um, there were signage improvements there that um, would be a, a separate discussion, I believe. But that's that's in a nutshell what I recall from the high risk rural roads package. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm sure there's a few people here, perhaps that uh, live on Stowe Street, who'd be the first to to like to weigh in on this issue. Feel free to speak up. I am uh, Matt Green. I live on East Street. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Um, so I commute through town every day uh, to Bicycle Express over across from Snowfire uh, by bicycle. Uh, so I've seen a lot of progressive driving, erratic speeds, um, and just a lot of pedestrian traffic that uses the street anyway. Um, and through that, you know, with the construction and stuff like that that's been going on over the past couple of years, there's certainly been an uptick in uh, regular use traffic on Stowe Street, um, which explains in part some of the, uh, you know, erratic driving and stuff like that. Um, but moving forward, I think, you know, with the fact that there is very little shoulder and stuff like that um, on Stowe Street, uh, slowing traffic down would increase safety for those that use it for commuting uh, by bike or walking and stuff like that uh, going forward. So I uh, just like to put my voice out there and kind of make that issue um, as known as it needs to be because Nobody wants to get run into the guardrail. <laughs> no, that's true. Um, and you're right. Uh, Stowe Street is narrow to begin with. Um, and with the additional traffic from the construction project, um, that does add an increase uh, percentage of risk. Um, but I will, you know, I'm sure you're probably a pretty conscientious bicycle rider, but I'll, I'll tell you today, uh, had a guy working with me that drives truck uh, almost every day. And um, we were headed into Stowe there on 100 and uh, talking about the bicycle lane that is now on 100. And uh, he pointed out there was a couple of guys riding the bike up just how close to that white line they were, uh, the bicycle riders. Um, and at, back when the Route 100 project began, um, VTrans had mentioned that they were going to narrow up the travel lane for vehicles by a foot to allow for this uh, bike lane. And by law, you're supposed to stay three feet away from a bicycler. Well, now they have their bicycle lane, but they're hugging the white line, which is right up against the travel lane. And it's making it difficult for, you know, the travel lane's already been narrowed. Uh, and when you're driving big truck, it's uh, pretty difficult to shrink that thing up a little bit when you're caught in a tough spot uh, where uh, there's no option. Um, so I just, I, plead with bicycle uh, operators to try to utilize those lanes, you know, as, as center as possible, uh, or even to the, perhaps to the right for their own safety. Um, and then tonight when I was turning on to Gupto Road, uh, the same guy was with me coming back to my house and a guy on a bicycle was coming down the golf course road. Uh, and he never, he never looked, he never looked. And I, I had to hit my brakes cause I thought he was coming right out in front of me. Um, he barely slowed down and he rounded the corner, never looked to see if any oncoming traffic, uh, was nearby. And, uh, that's risky for, for, you know, people to do things like that. So, um, I understand your concerns, um, uh, but there's also, you know, there's, there is issues with bicyclers um, 
not really doing the right thing all the time uh, and putting themselves at risk. Uh, as far as um, the speeding is concerned, um, that's everywhere. And I quite honestly don't know how to address it. We talked uh, a couple of meetings ago about Little River Road um, and some different options there of which I was for none of them. Uh, my vote has been right along to double our fines for speeders uh, and take the burden off from uh, the good taxpayers. Um, but that, that failed to go anywhere. So I'll leave it up to some of the rest of the board to maybe come up with some better ideas as to how to handle uh, these issues. Because I don't think they're going away no matter what we do. Amy, I think, or the person underneath Amy's name, I think you're about to say something. Oh, is that me, Dana Allen? Uh, okay, yeah, just um, Dana Allen, 48 Stowe Street. I was the one who put together a letter of support. Uh, I believe Carla forwarded you all that PDF this morning. Um, just sort of showing that there is a lot of support for traffic calming measures along Stowe Street. Uh, and a lot of the residents who responded also brought up um, railroad and union. Uh, there's definitely a lot of traffic cutting through using those two streets to avoid construction uh, or just as a quote unquote shortcut. Um, so we're seeing a lot of this usage of these streets as sort of like almost secondary arterials when in fact they're residential side streets. And so it's, it's super hard to, you know, get people to do 25 miles an hour. Um, since I live on Stowe street, I'm kind of a grumpy old man about it. And I drive 25 and I get, I get pushed down the street right on my bumper fairly frequently. I've been passed on Stowe street, which was exciting. Um, and again, you know, as a, as a cyclist, uh, as well as a motorist, you know, I like to use my bike in town to reduce the number of cars circulating as much as possible. Um, and I'm super conscientious. Most cyclists, I'd, I'd say all cyclists in Vermont are, um, you know, they're motorists as well. So they're very conscious of the rules. Um, and so what prompted this particular, uh, you know, letter, email to you guys to, to get this on the agenda was, was almost getting run over by a driver who um, ignored a hand signal and passed um, actually right in front of my house, which is a, it's a blind hill. Um, there's a couple of blind intersections depending on the way you come. So I think that, I think that we can all agree that something needs to be done. And Steve and Bill, I appreciate your efforts on this and thank you for letting me know uh, about that VTrans program. It sounds, like there is some positive movement. Uh, I'm curious, is there a definite timeline for that? Uh, or is it contingent on funding? Is there a way to get more information on that? <clears throat> um, and frankly, what can we as citizens do to help this along? There are traffic calming um, demonstration packages that are available from organizations like Local Motion. Um, that use temporary measures to sort of set things up as to how could this potentially work. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious if there is a timeline associated with that VTrans project. Um, and if you don't know right now, that's that's totally fine. Yeah, uh, but it'd be great to know at some point. Yeah, well, um, I don't have a specific date yet, Dana. Uh, as I said, uh, Mario Giroux, Depigny Giroux said that contractors have submitted proposals and I believe, and I'm just reading from his email, I believe these are being evaluated now. It is our hope that the project will be constructed this year. So it's July now, this year would mean, you know, uh, I would imagine before October. I think a couple things, what Steve indicated, we need to pay attention to that as far as Stowe Street is concerned. Uh, most of what we're talking about is gonna happen this year is probably signage. Uh, the paving project, you know, there were new sidewalks put on Stowe Street, I don't know, it's probably six years ago now. Uh, it was supposed to be a sidewalk paving project at that, at that time. And if 
the paving had been done at that time, I think some of the center line, and I don't know if they were going to put in rumble lines or whatever, but um, that the paving portion of that project got pulled. So the sidewalks were done, the paving did not happen, and we will still, you know, it's one of the streets that that we'll need to do. Uh, to, to your other points, Dana, I just want everyone to understand that both Stowe Street and Union Street are class two arterial town highways. They're not considered residential streets for the purposes of the state's transportation infrastructure. Um, and again, Steve is on the uh, Regional Planning Commission um, does a lot with traffic. He can probably explain a class two road better than I can, but it, it basically measure, it's a measure of volume and the fact that these roads are collecting uh, traffic from the residential streets and bringing them to class one town highways, which would be Main Street, Route 100, uh, Route 2, and then uh, the interstates. So Union Street and Stowe Street both are, are more than a standard class three highway. Guptill Road is the same. It's also a class two road. So it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge. And, uh, to, and I, I don't want to, I'm not contradicting you, Dana. I believe that you probably are a conscientious bicycle rider. Say that all Vermont bicyclists are motorists as well, and they're all conscientious. The number of bicyclists that I see blow through the red light at the top of Stowe Street, you know, they're coming up Main Street, they look to their left, there's nobody, there's nobody on Stowe Street with the green light, they just keep going. I haven't seen one stop for a stop sign, you know, whether it's on Neyland Flats coming down the hill to go up the road, uh, they just, they look left and they say, well, there's nobody coming, so I'm going to go. And um, it, it, takes, it takes cooperation from everyone if we're going to make it safe. So I would encourage you bicyclists out there to really pay attention to what the rules of the road say. If it's a stop sign, you're supposed to stop. If it's a red light, you're supposed to stop. But... With regard to the, uh, these two projects, none of them have anything to do with actual physical traffic calming right now. It's, it's signage packages, I believe, we're talking about in the, Steve, correct? You're muted, Steve. No, I, believe, I, know, I believe you're right, Bill, um, that the, this phase will be additional and updated signage. And then the, the traffic calming, and I can share examples of what um, was right. given to us four years ago. But so two, uh, so, Thank you, Steve. So uh, two things I would like to recommend. Uh, Chris and I spoke a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I was hoping maybe we could wait until October when we are in person again, rather than to try to do it on Zoom. But I think it's, you know, we've been in this coronavirus world for several months now. And uh, I had reached out to Lieutenant White of the state police back in February to try to arrange for him to select board meeting where we could talk about concerns that we have. And clearly speeding is a big issue. And when I get uh, emails from the public, I got, you know, Dave's email, I got emails from people about Winooski Street. I forward those to Lieutenant White and say, these are complaints that we're receiving about speeding, about unsafe traffic. Please inform the troops about them. Now, we don't have it for tonight's agenda, but the uh, uh, police report just was sent to uh, myself and Mark Mateer today probably going to put it into graphic form like he's done for us in the past and maybe at maybe I'm on the 10th we can talk about that report I looked at it only briefly this afternoon I think the state police wrote 10 tickets in June and frankly you know that's not a lot of tickets 10 for speeding they wrote a, a lot of you know they wrote other tickets for defective equipment for 
you know, going through stop signs. I'm not saying they only wrote 10, but I, I believe it was only 10 for speeding. And uh, I think the issue is really more enforcement than anything. Uh, whether we double the fines or not, you know, and I walk on Stowe Street almost every day. I park at the park and ride and I walk to work, walk down the sidewalks on Stowe Street. I hollered at a kid the other day in front of the school who was probably going 35 or 40 when I hollered at him. And then after I hollered at him, he went 60. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what, what happens. And uh, you know, people don't like it when you call them out on their bad behavior. But I do see the police cruiser, the state police cruiser, pretty at least once a week, I see them at the pullout on Stowe Street. So I know they're out there. I think we we should try to have Lieutenant White in, and whether we uh, leave it to the select board, I would prefer to do it in person as opposed to a meeting like this, but it's the board's call, and we're hoping to start meeting again in person in October. And then, you know, Steve, maybe we can try to get Mario in again. We have almost a completely new select board now from the one that signed up for this bring him in and talk about what they can do both with these sign packages and a little bit more information. If we were to get um, Stowe Street repaved, what might we be able to do there? You know, speed bumps, I think, are not the ideal location for most locations like Stowe Street and Union Street. They're just, they have too high traffic volume. I understand that people see them in certain places. They have mixed results. Um, you know, there are people that complain about the noise that they make. Um, they cause drainage issues sometime. And we have people on, on Randall Street who asked to have them taken out. So they're, they're not always the panacea. But anyway, Steve, maybe we can reach out to Mario and try to get him into a future select board meeting in the not too distant future. Yeah, we can definitely do that. And he can show examples of traffic calming. And um, Bill's correct. Uh, Mario recommended not putting speed table or speed bumps on Stowe Street due to the traffic, but there are other methods that he would be glad to share with um, with the select board and with others. And Chris? 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 Yes. Yes, Carla, I'm having problems here or something. I don't know if it's me or is it? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Barely. You're kind of breaking up. Yeah. We'll restart. All right. Sarah, you want to go? Well, we have two, we actually have uh, two hands up. One, the first one was Roger, and the second one was Emily Heyman. Can you add Sarah Morgan to that afterwards? Sure. Does Roger still want to speak? Um, sure, can you hear me? Yes. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I think the um, item that was raised about bicycles and bicy bicyclists not being safe is a, uh, what do they call it, a false canard. Uh, it, they're children that walk along Stowe Street, um, especially if school is in session. There are uh, plenty of pets that go along Stowe Street. I think the calming needs to happen on Stowe Street whether it's a construction boulevard for people to get around the intersection, I don't think we should be pinning blame on bicyclists only. The, the pedestrian traffic on Stowe Street is, is great. So that, that's all I wanted to say at this point. Thank Roger, you. Can I have your last name? Uh, Tubby, T-U-B-B-Y. Okay, thank you. I'll, cha I'll change it up here. Emily is next. Hello, I'm Emily Heyman. Um, I'm a resident of South Main Street, and I bike and drive in town. Um, I would like to point out that 
when you're driving at 30 miles per hour, your likelihood of killing a pedestrian is 9%. If you go 10 miles faster at 40 miles per hour, that likelihood increases to 50%. Most traffic accidents and traffic fatalities are related to poor infrastructure design. When a road is designed for people to go fast, they go faster, myself included. I remember a Front Porch Forum post from years back where a family was um, grieving the loss of their cat that died on Stowe Street because someone was driving too fast. And ever since then, I try to avoid Stowe Street unless I absolutely must go up it, um, more so with construction. And when I do drive on it, I always think of that situation and remember to drive slow. So I think there's a lot we can do to encourage people and remind them of these important statistics because people are driven by emotion. When they see the blinking speed sign, they like to see how fast they can make the number go. When they see a speed bump, they slow down to it and then they speed up when they pass by. I think a select board meeting is not the time to be playing traffic engineer or playing bridge engineer. It's a time to think about what our options could be uh, perhaps even consider establishing a bike ped committee. We know our town staff is pushed on their time, pushed on their capacity. A staff committee could help um, look at these options, play advocate when needed at, for state funding, um, and also test out examples. Dana mentioned the local motion demonstration kit. This would be a temporary option where we could play with a couple ideas in terms of pa pavement markings um, or bump outs along some of these streets like Union, Stowe, et cetera, and play with them on a temporary basis where <clears throat> it's not the permanent paving, it's not the per permanent build out. Try out these options and not feel defeatist about how some bikers drive, how some drivers drive, and remember the core fact that the way our infrastructure designed has an impact on how people drive, what their speed is, and reminding people of those core facts around uh, fatalities and how a slight difference in speed can save a life. Um, I would personally be happy to be on a bike ped committee if Waterbury wants to establish one and take these options and look at them from a constructive positive side as opposed to a negative point of view. Thank you. So Sarah's next. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Cheryl. Thank you for your time. So I grew up in this village. I've biked in it since I was a kid, and I've driven it for a while. Um, I, for one, really do not want to drive over bumps to get to my house every day. I don't think that you can make people drive well. It's just how they drive. I think there's there are ways to limit traffic speeds, but I, you can't make people drive the way they're going to drive. On Randall Street, I see them drive behind, in between the speed bumps. They race, slow down, speed bump, race, slow down, speed bump. I just, I think we've become a town where there's a lot of biking going around and we're not used to the amount of volume of the bikes. It might just be Maybe there is a better signage issue that we need to have so that everybody remembers that bikes and cars share the road. Um, I'm also concerned that, you know, a lot of these people aren't here. They, they rent, they come in for a few years, and then they leave. I don't want to have a permanent situation that occurs that we're all having to deal with 10 years down the road. And as um, it was talked about earlier, these don't seem to work very often, the speed bumps. They're more of an impediment than they are a, a help. So for me, who lives off of Stowe Street, I, I'd actually ask you not to have those on there. Thank you. Hey, um, Sarah, is still with us? Sorry, I thought you said Cheryl, not Sarah. My apologies. Oh. Sarah, are you here? No. Okay. Thank you. Oh, wait. Here we go. Can you hear us now? Oh, 
Okay, hi, this is Matt Moran with my, my wife, Sarah. And uh, we've lived in Waterbury uh, for about, oh, 2003. yeah. And uh, we've lived on uh, Swayze Court, which is right off from Stowe Street. And um, yeah, interesting discussion on, on, on bikes and, and cars. And, uh, you know, certainly I've seen my, my share of uh, really bad car drivers and, and bad bikers. And uh, obviously one is a lot more vulnerable too if uh, things go wrong. But um, to me and, and to us, I think one of the most significant things about Stowe Street is that uh, we have an elementary school right there. Uh, both of our kids have gone through the elementary, uh, one's at middle school, one's at the high school now. And over the years, uh, you know, they were able to, to walk to school and we'd walk with them, particularly until they were older, because um, we had too many close calls. And uh, in, in one case, um, came so close to being hit, both my younger son and I, uh, by a car speeding right through the, uh, the crosswalk. And uh, I fortunately was probably the only case where I've accosted a driver and uh, definitely gave them uh, uh, at the time, uh, some thoughts on, on their speeding through a school zone. Um, but I, I think that's one of the most significant things in my mind um, is that it just seems like it's an accident waiting to happen. One of the major crossings at that elementary school is, is right at the top of the hill there on Stowe Street, and it's really unsafe. Um, oftentimes there's, there's cars that are parked to on Stowe Street that further obscure view of both the pedestrian and of the drivers coming up the hill. And I, I just think that, uh, you know, it's been lucky that there hasn't been someone hurt badly yet. And um, it just seems like something could be done. Uh, I liked a lot of what I think it was Emily was saying about design, about maybe there's some things that could be done to help to and better ensure that people aren't uh, flying up that hill. Um, and I think we even heard like one of the uh, crossing guards even got uh, rushed or clipped yeah. by a vehicle. Um, and they're, you know, in a reflective vest with a big stop sign. Um, so, uh, and then outside of school hours, obviously there's a lot of, you know, beyond weather crossing guards there. There's a lot of kids that go in and out of there. And, and again, to, to me and to us, I think that's probably the biggest concern we have. And I think it's different than most other streets in Waterbury. It's very unique. Yeah, people speed on Guptill and all over the town. I see it all the time. It's, it's definitely a problem and not unique to Stowe Street. But what is unique to Stowe Street is that we do have a school there and it would be great if uh, a little bit more consideration were maybe given if we have an opportunity with uh, some planning uh, during uh, upcoming uh, schedule work. Thank you. Yeah, and I just wanna, I just wanna say that um, uh, Swayze Court is a tiny little street, but um, we do have a lot of people who park for um, events, for school events, for town events. Um, uh, tourists who use Google Maps and they come down Stowe and they just don't know, you know, you come down that hill, go under the underpass, there's not a lot of houses around. You sort of feel like, yeah, I can go a little bit faster, I can go 40 or something. And, and the, the car isn't is great but he can't be there all the time so maybe like um for me i hate speed bumps but if we had something when i go into waitsfield for example there's a school right there which i know and i've seen enough, the cop there enough times and i see this the light telling me what my speed is and i'm like god i didn't know i was going that fast um and uh so that's enough with the deterrence some people need that like myself and uh and the sign to just slow it down a little bit. And I was curious um, if you could let us know if there's not funding for such a sign, if that's something that the public could fundraise for and perhaps get. Because personally, I think speed bumps are, that's, that's a tough sell on that road, but, um, but it is heavily used. And I feel like when I I've had little kids and dogs right across at that intersection, the crosswalk is poorly painted and I'm, I, you always have to look both ways when you cross the street, but I feel like I have to rush across that street because people, sometimes they come right up over very fast. And I, you know, thank goodness my kids are older. I don't have to worry about that. Thank you. And Chris? Chris? 
All right, um, Mark, you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, I was going to follow that up too. I, I mean, maybe some people might not be aware, but I actually lived next to Dana for 12 years. Um, I saw a lot of, I think a lot of the concern that residents are showing on that street, um, similar to other roads, like the Little River Road problem. Um, I guess my question to either Steve or Bill is in front of Prohibition Pig, there's always been that little crosswalk sign. I'm always when I was living there, I was always fearful of children getting hit because of what happens after school and all the cars start to park and pinch the road. Why don't we have, um, you know, that seems like that prohibition pig yield walk crosswalk sign sits permanently in front of prohibition pig. Is there a reason why Stowe Street can't have a similar thing right there? It's probably something that we could do, Mark. Yeah, and I mean, I think the other comments about, and of course, I think every time we have concerns around speeding is the uh, the active speed. Um, but maybe if we, we do do that idea of having one that we can move around town as we try to address things. But I also, I'll, I'll follow up Bill's comment of, I do believe we have an enforcement issue too. Uh, my concern is that either we're not getting enough out of the contract or we just don't have enough officers to help curtail the direction we seem to be going with speeding. There are some options with regard to the, um, to the flashing speed limit signs. Uh, we have we have three permanent installations in Waterbury. Two of them are on Stowe Street, right above East Street, as Steve indicated. And then the one on uh, just before you get to um, Cross Road coming from Ben and Jerry's. That's also uh, the town owns that one. But um, <clears throat> the village used to have at least one, if not two, uh, portable signs that could be moved around and actually mounted on, um, on signposts. So if you had a speed limit sign, you could mount it on a speed limit sign. I know they were mounted on no parking signs over on Union Street. Uh, I did ask Bill Woodruff to look into those. They are relative, they're very affordable, frankly, uh, and we probably should invest in a couple of those. Um, and if you move them around enough, I think part of the problem with the permanent ones is just like anything else, uh, when it becomes permanent, it just becomes part of the background and people don't pay attention to them. And if it's there for a couple of days, well, oh, that's brand new and you slow down a little bit. So uh, I'm not saying we're going to take the ones down that are on Stowe Street, but I think they were much more effective when they were first put up than they are now. Um, uh, but we can buy those signs that can be moved around. I think they're in the three to five thousand dollar range, which would include, you know, a battery pack and the like. So if the select board is willing to go ahead and allow something like that, you don't really have to make a motion. But uh, that's something that we can probably buy right away. I don't know how quickly it will get here. You know, there's a lot of things that. We order right now, and just because of uh, COVID, uh, shipping takes a long time. But if that's something that the select board would be interested in, two of those signs, we can order those pretty quickly. I, I would be in support of, of that part. Um, Brian Shea, I live at 86 Stowe Street. Um, one thing I was thinking about talking about these signs is they have the signs that have the flashing blue light on them. Um, and I know that when I'm driving and I'm going a little too fast and the sign tells me I'm going too fast, that blue light flashes and that really gets people to slow down. Um, and I think that's another thing that's worth considering because uh, blue obviously means police to most people in Vermont. So. Yeah, we can we can look into that. I know the um, 
on the state highways, the state does not allow any strobe lights at all. There was a strobe light on that one on Route 100 just before Crossroad, and uh, the sign was disabled for about three months while they tried to figure out how to get the strobe light off of it. But Stowe Street's a town road. I think we could probably do that there. But uh, we, we can look into that. There's, there's a myriad of options, as I said. Um, and we'll just try to, you know, uh, they're, they're portable and we can, we can move them around and it will help a little bit, I hope. So I apologize, I apologize here. My computer failing. Now I got <laughs> vaccine here on my wife's computer. Um, and so is there anybody else that wants to say anything on this subject? We go ahead, Amy. Hi, friends and neighbors. Amy Scharf. I'm at 39 Stowe Street, homeowner, cyclist, pet owner and mom of two kids who are out crossing the street, using the sidewalks, et cetera. A um, couple of things that I've just share and take notes on is, uh, as I'm walking through the house to a better place to sit. Um, I live down uh, in the Victorian that's down towards Union Street. And there's also the fact that people kind of like to jump that bridge that's like right about there. Um, so it is like a game of chicken sometimes about trying to cross the road here, uh, right at the intersection of railroad and union and Stowe street. Um, the other things that I heard, uh, like there's the paving project coming in. I actually was talking to my son as we were bicycling and I was thankful that it's not paved. I've been thankful that Stowe street is bumpy and cracky and that make some people slow down and I do feel when it when it does get paved that it's just going to create more of a racetrack um, as the Moran said we have the school right here but the school I'm feeling right now in summer and the unknown with COVID it seems like this summer I'm seeing a lot more people just peeling through past my house and um, I don't know if it's just, okay, school's out, so they're not worried about hitting kids, but with school being partial or whatever, I'm fearing that that may continue, let alone there's not a lot for people to do right now. Um, the conversation about bicyclists, I think I kind of rolled my eyes, honestly, when you guys were all talking about it because it's a totally separate issue, I think, about uh, cars speeding on roads and erratic driving. Um, and the bicyclist community uh, just makes this economy thrive in Waterbury. So um, the other thing I want to say is I did hear, uh, Bill, you just talked about um, could invest in some signs, and I heard Mark Fryer backing that, so I'd like to hear more from the other board members with that. I also heard um, Mark Fryer talk about the crosswalk in front of Pro Pig and Bill responded with a, a could maybe happen. And so if it is something that improves safety here, then I think the could maybe can turn into should and will. Um, and speed bumps, nobody likes a speed bump, but nobody likes a kid run over on the sidewalk either. And part of the things that I worry about is speed and people jumping curbs, jumping the sidewalk. Like we've said, I've had a hard time just getting out of my driveway because of the speed that comes past my house. It is kind of a quick get out there and try to take off before somebody comes on either side to rear end. Um, and another thing besides, I mean, we have so many children around here and the good thing is, is they are getting outside during COVID. Um, they're scootering, they're skateboarding, they're biking, uh, they're social distancing literally on, in yards across the street from each other to have a conversation. Um, we also do have a hearing impaired child on our road and she can look both ways and look both ways again and then go, but with some of the speeds that are happening, somebody could be right on top of a kid in an instant. So um, my history too, is I was on a select board for four years and I understand the, the work and struggles and I appreciate 
the time and the time away from your families that you're taking. Um, and I appreciate this town. I love where I live. And I don't, I'd rather see and hear rumble strips at night when I sleep with my windows open than have somebody get hurt. And I'm just afraid that it's just a matter of time that, that somebody gets hurt. So how we can prevent it, then I'd say all, all people forward, please. That's it. Hey, Chris. Yes. I'm not trying to take over your job, but I can see when people have their hands up that want to speak. So if you're okay with it, I'll just keep um, yeah, for some, them in order. For some reason, I'm getting feedback here. Uh, Did you hear what I said? Yeah. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah. So next up, are you, getting, are you getting feedback on your end? A tiny bit, but I can hear you well. So no, go ahead and take take the meeting. Next up was Mike. Yep. I just, I just want to make a comment. I thank all the public for their input on this issue. It is a serious matter. And I know the select board, at least I know I take this very, very personally. But the problem is we have so many roads that we can't have every road having speed calming devices, having police officers patrol. Yes, I do think that by rotating uh, police in different things to have some enforcement, I always say a couple of speeding tickets go a long way to slowing down in, in individuals. And I think maybe because of COVID, I think we're not, we're not seeing the amount of tickets that we normally see written. Um, you know, people who are responsible, you know, aren't going to get tickets. People who are driving fast, and I don't think they're going to be giving someone a ticket for 30 miles an hour and a 25. They're looking at the, which the one we're all concerned is the people going 50 miles an hour up Stowe Street. I do think, I agree with Mark. Uh, I'm all for, you know, purchasing a couple of different devices that can be rotated around. I think that's the key is rotating devices to different places so that so it doesn't become part of the background we need to kind of have people hey this is something i see this you know that you know they slow down and it becomes habit and you know a few weeks later they're probably going to start going faster and hopefully it's going to rotate back around in a little bit but i think whoever had the idea of maybe forming a committee uh bouncing around some ideas you know, I don't think we could have traffic calming on, on every street in, in Waterbury. It's very difficult, especially on the highways. I think a, a highway, a, a road like Stowe Street has special concern because of, you know, the kids going up, up and down. And we all just got to take, whether you're a motorist, whether you're a bicyclist, we all got to just take better care and think about your, your neighbors as to how you drive, you know, both a bicycle you know, walk, you know, I see people who are walking who don't even think about walking. They just start across the street. And, you know, I've almost hit a couple of people that way. And, you know, we all just need to be respectful to our neighbors. Thanks. The last person I see that had their hand up is Carrie. Hey, everybody. Um, I just wanted to, well, I guess I should say where I live. Um, so I, my name is Carrie Lohr. Um, this is my husband, Alex King. Um, we're residents of 17 Hill Street Extension in the village. Um, we used to be renters on South Main Street, um, and we were lucky to purchase a house in the village a couple years ago. Um, thank you for um, adding this topic to the agenda and giving everybody here um, the time and space to share their perspectives and their experiences. Um, I just wanted to add my voice to the conversation as um, uh, I guess a multi-use user of Stowe Street. Um, our road is um, a little side street at the end of High Street. Um, so, you know, for us, when we're commuting to work, um, go down High Street, hit Stowe Street, and that's how we're starting our commute for the day. Um, I guess what I just wanted to add um, as a cyclist, as a, as a walking pedestrian, we walk our dog on this road almost every single day. Um, and as a driver is, um, 
you know, just the speed just feels out of control sometimes. And it's not, um, I just, I think everybody in town deserves to feel safe. Um, and, um, you know, just to echo a couple of comments about the kids using the sidewalk, whether it be on their Strider bikes, whether it be they're walking to school from either um, the direction of Hen of the Wood or from the direction of the reservoir. Um, one thing that really comes to mind that's really concerning is in the winter when the kids are crossing the street um, from Thatcher Brook to go cross country skiing in the field, you know, like they have to cross not even really as a, at a designated crosswalk. Um, and so that's, you know, that's something that I um, worry about outside of, you know, my own safety as a driver and as a cyclist, um, just to kind of, um, again, just echo um, a couple conversations about just sort of that blind hill right there. Um, I was talking to somebody else who's on this call right now earlier about you know, once I, if I'm riding my bike or even, you know, walking my dog, once I get to the crosswalk that's at um, that corner of Swayze Court and Stowe Street, I will either pull my bike over and stop and get off because there's a chance that while I've checked behind me to see if there's a car coming or not, by the time I've already looked ahead again to make the turn to make sure that nobody else is coming from the other direction towards me, that somebody could be right behind me and hit me, um, which is scary. Um, and I don't like it. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, kind of the same thing with our dog. It's like, I'd like to not run across the street at that crosswalk to make sure that I don't get hit by somebody who is late for work, or maybe they're late to drop their kids off at school or they're late for an appointment, whatever. Like they've already kind of gotten the speed, whether it be um, the curve underneath the bridge, you know, the viaduct bridge by Hen of the Wood, or they're coming down the hill um, from the direction of the reservoir. So um, anyway, lots of great conversations here and um, perspectives. Um, and I really appreciate, um, you know, everybody taking the time this evening to talk about this and all the considerations of lots of different solutions that seem to be available to consider. So thanks. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think everybody has kind of covered um, the bases here. I mean, I, I'm also sort of a multi-user. I, I, I also cross the road where the kids do to cross country ski in the field. Um, I guess I'll just add that there are a lot of places on Stowe Street that people cross the road. Um, there's that one that's kind of in the dip across uh, to cross into the, the field down by the river um, on both sides of the Stowe Street Bridge um, over the railroad tracks um, under the highway. There's, you know, the parking area that's down there that doesn't really have a crosswalk to and from it. Um, so th there are a lot of places where people cross the road because the sidewalk ends or, or what have you. Um, and or they're trying to access some of the other parts of town. So I, I think, um, you know, I guess, as others mentioned, I think Emily mentioned that, you know, a group to kind of discuss some of the um, ideas for traffic calming and, and or just kind of, you know, how we design the street better um, would be good because, you know, personally, I wouldn't be in favor of repaving the street at all because the, uh, the, potholes and speed bumps are the only form of speed control that we have right now. Um, and I'd, I'd rather keep those than, you know, um, make a, another um, drag strip through town. So anyway, sure. thank, you, thank you all for your, um, your time tonight. And uh, Louise has her hand up. Hi everyone, Louise Linelac, 48 Stowe Street, married to Dana Allen. Um, I'm just gonna say this <laughs> really quickly. Um, you know, to reiterate one of Carrie's points, actually, Dana, you might have to mute your computer. It's echoing. Um, sorry about that, hold on one second, guys. Yeah. 
So I wanted to reiterate uh, one of Carrie's points. Um, I um, I agree with a lot of what she said, and um, you know, while while I don't personally have kids, Dana and I don't have kids. Um, you know, I do tend to fear for myself when I'm pulling out of my driveway sometimes uh, because of the lag time that she mentioned. So uh, one of the things that's really tricky about living right at the top of the hill, and this is something that people um, pulling in and out of high street experience as well, um, and Swayze Court, is that there's a pretty significant blind spot. So what I have to do when I pull out of my driveway is I have to look if I don't see a car uh, when I'm pulling out, there's actually no way, like went down the, down the street, probably about, you know, a couple hundred feet. I, there's no way for me to know if there's somebody already zooming up the hill there. It's a complete blind spot. If I see somebody in that dip, then I know that in like 20 seconds, they're going to come up on me and I can, I can anticipate that. And I just wait, but that blind spot uh, is significant more than more more so not just because it's hard to anticipate that but because it comes right after a straightaway so the um the speed sign on stowe street is before hen of the wood and what happens is that um even with the cop there every once in a while although it, i really like that i do think that there's there's something to be said for having that cop there more often because um it's just not enforced enough. People will hit speeds up to 45, 50 miles an hour on that straightaway coming over the top of that hill. And there's literally no way for me to anticipate that. If they're already going that speed and I can't see them, some my car is just going to get crushed someday. Um, and, and then you add into the mix children crossing the street, dogs crossing the street. The fact that people can't see the... Um, the street crossing anymore because it's been it's the the sidewalk but the the crossing is basically worn away so you can only see the sides of it at this point um it does definitely need to get repainted whether or not it the the road is repaved somebody needs to repaint that um and i think that it's like it's the visual cues that are really important for people and i you know i think I can't remember who mentioned it but it's nice to have that signal for those of us who need it who that, you know, like, oh, hey, you're going 10 miles too fast, you need to slow down. But the fact is that it's very easy for anyone to pick up another 10, 15 miles an hour on that straightaway, because there is no um, traffic calming that occurs coming into town past that sign. And people pick up speed past 10 of the wood very rapidly there. And I don't, I think most people aren't trying to. I really do truly believe that most people don't even realize that they're going that fast. So for me, it's like, yes, it's enforcement, but it's also very clearly not on people's minds on that straightaway. And I think that we need to come up with other options, um, you know, like the local motion, um, program that we can test out to see if there are traffic calming uh, solutions for that particular area and for the area that Amy Sharp was talking about because I for one cross at the top of the bridge because it's so scary to cross below the bridge I'm worried about somebody clipping me at the bottom of that bridge so yeah so so just a, a final word I appreciate all of your input and your concern and you know sometimes folks don't understand that we can only do what the state law allows us to do. And there are, there are traffic standards that we have to live with. So for those of you who don't see the chat, there's been a number of folks wondering if speed limits could be 15 or 20 miles an hour, especially near the school. Municipalities by state law have the ability to set speed limits between 25 and 50. We, we can't go below 25. That's the lowest speed limit we're allowed to set. Um, everything in the former village is already 25. Every street in the village is, tw is 25 miles an hour. So uh, we've got them posted as, as low as we can post them. Uh, the, the conversations about crosswalks. When the dry bridge was reconstructed probably 15 years ago now, um, you know, we asked for crosswalks across from the corner of uh, Railroad Street to the corner of 
Union Street. So there would be a crosswalk there. And the state says you can't have a crosswalk there because it doesn't meet the sight distances for a crosswalk. You can't see that crosswalk when you're coming over the dry bridge until you get to the top. So the state, to me, it's like, well, if there's a crosswalk there, at least people coming from the school will see the crosswalk. And when you get to the top of the bridge, you'll see the crosswalk. People are gonna cross there, whether there's a crosswalk or not. Wouldn't a crosswalk be better? You can't put a crosswalk there. I asked, to, can we put a crosswalk at the top of the bridge? Charlie Adams, who used to live on Swayze Court, was a trustee when, when I was first hired here in 1988, and he grew up there on Swayze Court, and he told me that his mother told him the best place to cross Stowe Street was at the top of the dry bridge, because you can see in both directions, and everybody can see you. But no, you can't put a crosswalk at the top of the dry bridge because it doesn't meet the, 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 set, the, the sight distances. <clears throat> Where the children go down into the field for cross-country skiing, there's only a crosswalk on the east side of the road. There's no crosswalk on the west side of the road. Unless there's a crosswalk, I mean, unless there's a sidewalk on, the, on, the, on both sides of the road to accept a crosswalk, you can't put a crosswalk there. So maybe we can think about building across a sidewalk from, from uh, Swayze Court down to that uh, driveway or whatever you want to call it into that field, but there's no, cross, there's no sidewalk there now, so you can't have a crosswalk there. We fight this fight on Route 100, trying to get a, a crosswalk from Stowe Street across to Blush Hill because people use it. Well, the, you know, and by the time you're done, it's a half a million dollar project to build all kinds of sidewalks in order to put a crosswalk across the street. So it's, it's very frustrating. And I don't, I'm not saying this to tell you that we can't do anything. I think the idea of the, of the sign like we have had on several of the crosswalks on Main Street, we can get that, I'm sure we can get that put up at the crosswalk at the school. We will certainly get the crosswalks painted. There's no question that they've worn off now. There's been no school for some time. We've you know, had highway crew uh, on, on furlough. So we're behind on some things, but we can get those kind of things done. But there are some things that seem commonsensical that it would be great to put a crosswalk in a particular location but the highway standards that we have to live by as the town won't let a crosswalk be put into those locations. So just understand we'll do what we can do, but we can't do what we're not allowed to do. And crosswalks where there are no sidewalks is one thing that we're not allowed to do. Carla. I'm yeah. I was just wondering if Things have changed here, but I'm still getting echo on my end. I can hear you fine. You can. Huh? Yep. Um, perhaps we could suggest to the um, state police who are patrolling that area to move to various locations up and down Stowe Street. If maybe that could just change up where people speed up on that straightaway, whether it's you know parking at where those parking spots are directly under the bridge or on that hill coming down where they used to park where there's uh, cement blocks in the winter. So maybe just switching up their location until we find like a more permanent, you know, solution or a sign. They, they do move around, Katie. They, they are in several places on the street. But uh, as I said before, you know, we, I, I try to communicate with Lieutenant White um, and I think it would be a good idea to have him to a select board meeting and have you folks be able to talk to him directly. So we'll try to set that up. And on that regard, do you want to, I mean, do you want me to try to get him to come and just do it on a Zoom meeting or do you want to wait for him to come in person? I mean, I'm fine with him coming in on a Zoom meeting and then when things calm back down and go back to normal, coming in regularly on a basis for updates would be stellar. Okay. Well, I, I'll make a statement here. Um, 
it sounds like we're going to walk the same path that we've walked several times before trying to mitigate these speeding problems. And uh, I'm just going to stand back and wait for these new ideas to be implemented and see where they go. And maybe at some point, if things don't change, we'll circle back around to possibly doing something with a speed fine. Even posting them on the roads, like I said, I mean, you people are speculating on the fact that you're saying that doubling this fines won't have an impact. But you don't know. You're just speculating. You never tried it. Um, and until you do, we won't know the results of it. So we'll continue <laughs> pouring effort into things that we've already done. Um, Chris, if you want very to, little results. I, I yeah. told you a couple of meetings ago, if the select board wants to amend the ordinance and deal with fines, go ahead and do it. And if you're talking about doubling the fines, that's very different than what you were saying a few weeks ago, where you were talking about $500 fines. I'm, I'm talking about just raising the fines so that it makes people slow down. Okay. No, until the board, the rest of the board has any interest in doing this, you know, there's no sense in entertaining it. So we'll exhaust these other efforts. If they work, great. If they don't, maybe then the board will reconsider doing something that impacts people's pocketbooks enough so they pay attention. I mean, I'll I'll step in and say that I I think I'll I was reacting similar to Bill that I think the proposal was a very large fine, but um, Bill, what is the how does that work in terms of the breakdown of the fine structure? I mean, I am interested in potentially raising the speed limit fines, but I'm not interested in creating something that is absorbent that impacts low income people to the point where they can't afford to pull out of a fine. Yeah, we, we can certainly look at what fines are reasonable and maybe the fines that we have now are, are too low. Um, and I don't have a problem uh, looking at the fines, but Chris, I mean, in the, in the past, you were talking about $100 parking ticket fines, you know, to, uh, and, and I said at that time, if you make a fine so that it's so high that a judge will just throw it out, it's not worth doing. So if you want to look at the fines, we can look at the fines. My question is, why are fines supposed to be reasonable? It defeats the purpose. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about we can talk about how raising the fine. I mean, if you don't if you, if you don't raise it to a reasonable amount, you know, don't have any impact. Laws need to be reasonable, Chris. Speed limits need to be reasonable. That's why, that's why speed limits, to change speed limits requires an engineering and a traffic study, and somebody earlier said that people drive, uh, the, that the conditions of the road allow, and that's, and that's true. And that's why speed limits, you know, I, I've brought the manual out many times before. You don't set the speed limit for the worst condition on the road. You, you set it for the reasonable conditions because most people drive the reasonable speed. Some people drive more than that, and that's where you need the fines. So if you want to look at fines, we can look at fines. I can do some research about what other communities have for fines, what, what levels seem to be reasonable. But as I said earlier, two meetings ago, whether you have a $25 fine or a $50 fine, the only time anybody gets a fine is if somebody stops them and writes a ticket. And I think enforcement is the biggest issue that we have here. We don't have enough enforcement of the rules that we already have. I agree. Louise has her hand up. Yeah, I just want to, I, I just like to say, Bill, that I agree with that. I think that um, it's important to have a balance between um, 
enforcing the law, enforcing the speed limit, because what I will say is if people are driving 25 miles an hour, the posted speed limit, I've been seeing a lot of the notes on the side. And as somebody who sees, I work from home, I see pretty much everybody go by. Um, and when people are driving the speed limit, I can, I can tell because it looks like a reasonable speed to go down Stowe Street. Um, and I can also anticipate them coming over that hill. So I feel a lot more safe when they are just going the posted speed limit. I do think that we, when we start to talk about exorbitant fines for people speeding, um, like Bill said, I think a lot of these people really just don't realize how fast they're going. Um, and I do worry about it uh, negatively impacting the process because, and I'm, I'm just one of those positive reinforcement kind of people, that's who I am, but, but I do think that um, to balance out uh, having more police uh, surveillance on that part of Stowe Street, it's important not to find them too much because my concern would be that that would build resentment and wouldn't necessarily uh, incentivize driving the speed limit at a certain point. So, um, and it would also make people less likely to buy into future um, traffic calming options. So I think that, uh, I guess I would encourage some kind of more even-handed approach is, is my final thought. Um, looks like, uh, like, uh, like uh, computer says uh, any of that. Go ahead. Um, so my name is obviously not Amy, but I talked before. Um, mm -hmm. I think even if we had somebody sitting on Stowe Street giving out warnings, that would have just as big an impact as giving out actual speeding tickets because it's it's the process of getting pulled over that makes people think twice about what they're doing. Um, so it's it. I don't think it's about the fines. I think it's about policing and, and it's about holding people accountable for what they're doing. You don't have enough don't police have enough force. Force. Police, all the problems that we're seeing now. We'd have to add on and add on three cops. Chris, you're, you're kind of echoing there. Not ready to go. Do you have any headphones? We've shut off We've everything. Shut off. Shut off. Chris, do you have your computer and a computer for Leanne on near each other? Because I can see Leanne on the meeting. Those two computers are echoing because they're too close to each other. The other one's downstairs. That's the only thing I can think of. Mark is just checking corn, yeah, tomatoes. tomatoes. I didn't think the meeting would be. Mark, Mark, maybe you should. Yeah, I can. Uh, I can help take over. Um, I, I messaged Chris asking the same thing if you have multiple windows open. Um, so I, I think we appreciate everyone's time coming tonight to talk about um issues on Stowe Street, as you may have heard, we, we're hearing this similar concerns on Little River and Cup and I think Stowe Street does have a unique situation. So I think we'll continue to look at the options and um, hopefully the state can help us understand some of the work that's being done on Guptill and Stowe Street signage that we've been waiting on. Um, and I do agree that I think forming some kind of group that can help the select board understand some of the options would be helpful. So if there's someone on this meeting that wants to help champion that, and um, I can discuss with Bill um, how those groups would be formed, and then we can follow up. But uh, unless anyone else has anything up, I think uh, in terms of time, we need to move on to the next to the next item. But I really do appreciate everyone coming in, and we hear you and your concerns, and hopefully we can come up with some solutions. Thank you all.
So next thing on the select board is the extension of the Zen Barn uh, entertainment permit. Um, I'm assuming Chris will want to uh, let me take over for this second. Um, so I guess I'll turn it over to Bill to talk about the request. And I'm assuming this is similar to the previous permit. I'm not sure if there's any changes, um, but I haven't heard anything uh, in terms of the last six weeks, if there's been any issues, which I know there were quite a few concerns going into uh, the last permit. Yeah, um, Ari and Noah Fishman both reached out to me and um, asked if, you know, they could go ahead and extend this permit. Um, I think that they may have thought that the permit was uh, uh, for longer than it was. And I went back and forth with them and sent them a copy of the, of the minutes where it was clear that the select board approved the entertainment outside for six weeks. Uh, I think we still have a couple of weeks to go on the uh, six week time frame, but Ari and Noah both said that, you know, they really needed to be able to communicate with the people that they were working with as far as entertainment was concerned and would like to, uh, you know, get this cleared up and ask if the select board would allow the entertainment to go through April 30th next year. Now, uh, they need an entertainment permit for both indoor and outdoor entertainment. Uh, you can do it all in one permit. I think it's pretty clear they're not going to have outdoor entertainment there at, you know, Christmas Eve or anything like that. But um, I asked Carla and uh, Karen both, uh, who, you know, answer the phones and take comments from the public, whether anyone has called to make any complaints or concerns, no one has. I haven't heard anything from anyone. So I just simply told uh, Ari that, um, you know, go ahead and, and ask the select board tonight. And if they had any comments or concerns, they could be addressed. Carla has the, uh, I don't have the permit that was issued in front of me, but clearly talked about uh, decibel level at the property line and I believe it was two nights a week for six weeks, Thursday night and one other night, I think it was. I think Ari's on the call. So if he wants to chime in, maybe that's the best place to start. And then the select board can ask questions and members of the public, if they're here for this issue, can express support or concern. So Ari, why don't you go ahead? Where's my phone? You're on. 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 you yeah, and I wrote you guys a, a email as well on this, but I mean, like I've said before, our business is very much linked with entertainment and food, and we're relying on this um, to provide this service to our customers to keep this business going, especially during COVID. Um, without COVID, you know, doing music inside is totally fine, and we're set up for that. That's our preference. Um, we found over the last um, several weeks of, trying this out that we had to tinker a little bit with the sound. Um, we've been doing, basically we have a bluegrass night <clears throat> on, on Thursdays. And then other than that, we've been doing solo singer songwriters on other nights. Um, I've been in close contact um, with Leanne and Chris and, you know, our other neighbors and checking in with them when we've done these shows to see if they have any issues with what we're doing. I've also been down to the property line and monitoring the decibel levels each time. Um, I've gotten to a point where I can tell now <clears throat> that if we, based on my system, I can shoot out a certain number of decibels. And now I've kind of got to the point where I can see if I put out a certain number of decibels, it's about 85 at the source, I know it's gonna be 60 decibels at the property line. Um, again, which is a very low level, like. I, I've been down there at the property line where a car drives by and shoots up to 70, 75. 
just to give you a sense of the relative nature of it. Um, and so, you know, and then we've been, I feel like, you know, we've been able to meet kind of the discussion we had before and establish some better dialogue with our neighbors. And I'm hoping that we would be able to keep doing this um, through COVID. Um, and we're hoping that we could do, um, you know, up to four nights a week in that capacity, you know, basically doing that kind of solo singer songwriters, mellow music outside under our tent. You know, um, I've got a lot of different artists that want to play there. And, you know, we just want to create that kind of a, a experience for our customers and hoping that we might be able to do that. Um, and then in terms of the indoor music, I wasn't sure if this was, you know, we talked to Bill and clarified that indeed that was tied in with this. So, you know, I, I guess I feel like if we're talking indoor music that, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen with COVID, but in general, I feel like we should be able to do indoor music generally inside. I don't, I don't believe we ever had a music, uh, an issue with the indoor music. Have you, have you talked with any of your other neighbors about um, upping the number of shows you do per week? And did you get a feel for what their thoughts on were that? Yeah, I mean, in terms of my other neighbors, I've, you know, the the Guptals across the street are very supportive. They usually come over and enjoy the music. They've, you know, and they help us. They're, they're, they're very, they love music and they come over all the time. Um, that's really the main other, and you know, the, we haven't had any other, I don't think in the history of this, I've had any other neighbors complain about the sound. I mean, then my parents and me are the next couple neighbors. So there's not a lot of other, um, you know, direct folks that have had any issue that I can, that I've had any, any that I've ever had an interaction with that I've ever had any problem with that. Um, I, I will say I went to your first bluegrass night after we had okayed it the last time and I thought it was really well done and it, it was okay. I liked it. <laughs> cool. Glad to, I, I'm, I, I didn't notice you there, but I, I probably was somewhere in the background, but glad to hear that. I mean, it did, it take a little tweaking. There was one or two nights like, you know, I, that Leanne mentioned were like a little too loud and I noticed the decibels were a little higher. So I, you know, I, I turn it down and we dialed the sound in and it did take a little tinkering, but I feel like we really got it figured out now. Um, so. Um, Leanne and Chris, yeah. I don't know how the sound is working. That's sad. Okay. I'm going to stand down. What are you doing? Okay. 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 Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, that's a lot better. I shut off your other device. You're good now. Good. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you're right. Sorry, it was one night there. We had a problem, but I have to be honest. I was happy with the only a few okay. nights because I have to be honest. We can hear it every night. That one night, it was a little louder. So I kind of and at the point of, I thought we had an agreement, we're all good. So you're all good with two nights? Yeah, I'm all good with two nights. But not forever, I just want to say. I just want to keep that in mind. We're not doing forever, I hope. I, I want to support them for sure. I, I, I get that. But, I don't want to have for the next 27 summers that it's like that. You know, it, it, I'll, I'll just, I'm trying to stay neutral on this uh, because I want my neighbors to be successful. Me too. It's, it's one thing if you come down a night or two a month to listen to music. That's, well, we have that's fine. Everybody can appreciate that. Um, but if you have to listen to it every night, after a while, it just, it wears on you. Um, so and they have been great. We, we're, we do say they have been great, but 
Yeah, they've I done, just don't want it every night. <laughs> um, my wife had said something earlier about if, if you were to increase this um, by one or two nights, if it could be revisited again uh, in a month. And maybe we'll, you know, it's one of those things. You don't know until you try it. Maybe, maybe it'll be fine. Um, but my other, what I said to him was, I don't think they should have to pay for a permit every time. No. If we're no. doing a. I, I already, I already told them that from my perspective, the permit, if it had been approved through April 30th next year, it would have been $25. So I, I told them they needed to get approval, but I wasn't going to charge them a permit for it because they've, they've paid for the permit, I think. Okay, so great. Because I, I didn't expect them to, you know. Right. So now they're here, you know, the issue that I thought we were talking about was extending it from the six weeks that was approved that still has probably two weeks to go to the rest of the you know summer in into the fall under the same conditions that it was before the, you know that, i'm sorry was, I, I, was I, I, yeah i didn't understand that i thought it was going to be more nights if it's only the two nights i'm good with that no no i yeah it's really i'm telling you what my understanding was was that it was going to be asked to be extended from the six weeks through the rest of the summer and fall, I just heard about the four nights just now. Okay. I have a problem with that. <laughs> right. So that's that's where we are at the moment. Okay. And, and to the point of the Guptals, and you know, I can appreciate the Guptals enjoying music. Um, they're on the front of the front of the building. Um, they don't get the direct impact that uh, that you do from the backside. It rides up this hill. She's, but I mean, Ari, had, Ari and Noah have both have been, They've been great. They've been great. Again, I want to support my neighbors. Ari, you want to talk? I just want to give um, Noah and Ari some props. I know sometime I've been a little critical of um you know some some of the uh music issues but i know i travel up the road quite frequently you know i go back and forth to home and back and i've been by there as a matter of fact i kind of if there's no one around i i slow my truck down if if my windows rolled up i roll it down and just here and i have barely been able to hear things so i think the sound may, maybe sometimes it's people aren't playing but i think for the most part what at least i'm hearing and that's kind of off-site which is usually what we're talking about i know we're not going to talk about what the decibel levels are right on site but if it's not traveling and i know chris is probably the one that it's most affected with sound coming up his hill but I think for most of the neighbors, I think it's been good. And I think you guys have done a good job. Uh, I'm, I'm for at least extending the permit based upon what we had before. I know we're hearing now two more days, but I think your neighbor kind of has a little bit of a concern with that. I think we did a give and take on that. So I, I, I'd just like to hang with that for a little while. Make me feel happy for a little bit. Sorry. I don't know. So a couple of things here, um, just to unpack. Um, you know, this is these are extraordinary times right now in our industry. And I realize a lot of people in here have government jobs, have construction jobs. Their job may have changed, but they're not on life support. A lot of the construction guys, business is doing better than ever. We are seriously hurting right now. And the difference from us to do a music night, we did an experiment last Wednesday because we said we were gonna just push it and do three nights because we had, we didn't realize the way the permit was exactly. And we said, you know what, let's cancel Wednesday night. 
our business went down 70% and it's already down. So then it dropped an additional to we're at a business level. So it's not like we want to do this. We need to. And when we originally went in, we asked for just to be able to do music. And we said, well, and our understanding was, oh no, we'll give you guys two nights as a trial, see how that goes. I understand it's a bit of a disturbance. I also have a feeling, you know, having grown up here, you know, Gupta Road used to be a lot quieter road back when it was Golden Horn East and we were kids and we'd play on the road. It's gotten louder and louder. It's a pretty steady stream of traffic. The car tire noise, at least at my house, is a lot louder than any music we play. And I get it's a bit of a nuisance, but it's also a matter of you guys saying, all right, well then put us out of business and let's see who ends up in there next. And, you know, what can they do? I mean, I moved back here eight years ago and had this opportunity to open a place next to the house I grew up in and have, a, have had a room in my entire life. I own land there that I want to build on and plan on being here my entire life. And it's just this, you know, kind of dream come true scenario that's a ton of work. I haven't taken a dime out of the place and we're just trying to, you know, make it happen. And, you know, last week or last select board meeting, I was pretty disheartened by the lack of support, not from my neighbors, but just in general from the select board. And I appreciate that, you know, we had to prove ourselves a little bit. And I think we've done that. We're again, we're also not trying to do shows right now. We'd love to. It would be great for us if we could throw a big party once in a while outside, late night, lights, sound, everything. That would be awesome. But we realize that isn't going to happen. Right now, we're literally just doing dinner shows where a person comes in, they play, the people come in, they have dinner, they sit and enjoy the show, and everyone's gone at nine. And when we don't do that, people are sort of like, you know what? I'm not going to go out to dinner. It's just with all this stuff in the news and everything that's going on, it's just, it ain't really worth it to us. I'll just stay home. I'll grab takeout. You know, then they don't get any, you know, they don't get any beverages. They don't get dessert. And it's, it's just not really a viable business for us. Um, I thought we'd be back to normal by June. And then I thought we'd be there by August, you know, now who knows. And uh, this winter is not going to be easy for us. We've got a few w months here where we can actually try to, get a little money in the bank. So we're not just begging the government for more money. And um, I don't know, it'd just be nice. You know, I feel like with Chris and Leanne, you know, you've got our number now and we will, you know, do anything we can. The second you tell us something's bugging you, turn it down, adjust it. I mean, I don't know, Noah, can we go a little quieter even? I mean, you know, what can we do on, you know, maybe these other nights we can get it even more tight and quieter and just something that gives us you know something to bring people out and and come in and uh you know that's kind of where we're at with things but it's not it's a lot of work for us to move everything outside and do the things outside we got to move the equipment in and out every night it's uh it's a ton and then the the last thing i want to just mention too that we keep we don't seem to mention is these artists that that's what they do for a living and they don't have a whole lot of options right now either um they're not getting ppp loans and you know these big these big government bailouts they're just trying to you know hey i got 150 bucks tonight sweet you know if i can do that a few nights a week i might be able to pay rent eat and it's uh it's a serious thing for them too so you know, it's just a big picture thing. And I do, you know, Chris and Leanne have been great and all our neighbors have been great. And, uh, you know, I guess we're just, we're just asking to, I mean, I don't know, I don't know. What do you think? I think some sort of continue sort of a trial period through the season. We're kind of open to that. If we could separate it from the indoor music and, um, but we'd like to be able to like get some more people in the door. Yeah, I mean, one thing is timing is, I mean, we're come October, mid October, we couldn't pay people to come to an outdoor show. So we're not talking about, and I don't think, you know, given what I see what's happening with COVID, I don't think we're going to be doing big, you know, shows inside, maybe some real mellow stuff, really spaced apart. I don't even know what's going to happen. The fall for restaurants, I think, is a really scary time. November's slow anyway, get with COVID. I mean, it's going to be really tough. So, we're trying to bank whatever we can right now because 
the next month, month and a half, it's like, you know, this is our time to make some money. I mean, we're asking for a time bound chance to do, you know, four nights a week. I mean, I'd restrict that as much as I need to, to be able to offer entertainment while people eat. If it's just, you know, acoustic music, which is what we've been doing anyway, we could probably keep that. You know, I know I can get the decibel level even lower than we've been doing. I wanted to kind of see what an ideal level would be. I know I can get it even lower. Um, you know, we wanted something is better than nothing for us. And it means it can be the different, it, like Ari was saying, it's like, we see a dramatic difference because people don't really want to go out. They'll go out. They need an excuse, you know, for our clientele, they need an excuse to come out. And it's, you know, the next few months are really critical for us. So if you guys would consider like a time bound, like, you know, through the, you know, into the early fall, you know, giving us that four nights a week, keeping that decibel level down, let us, you know, be in touch with the VNs and all our neighbors and make sure it works. You know, we'll, we'll keep it even lower. Um, I mean, I'm, we're all ears. We're trying to, we're trying to work with everybody um, and we can, we can right. make it well, work. Right. And we want you guys to succeed too. I mean, <laughs> we're all in business. We all know that. Can we do a month to month? And I agree. Can we just keep in contact? So what she's su suggesting is, like I said earlier, uh, I, I wouldn't be opposed to a four night thing. Uh, give it a month trial, see how it goes. Um, and if we have issues, you know, we'll, we'll work we've, it out with we've you. We've contacted, if, we've done that. And I think, I think in all honesty, you've got, you people are gonna do everything you can to keep us shut up. <laughs> <laughs> You couldn't buy us no. out, you know. Uh, that was going to be my next suggestion. Yeah. Take it all and we'll get the hell out and you can raise hell every night for all I care. Um, so, yeah, let's compromise here. We'll, we'll, we'll. Can we do it month to month? Can we check it? We yeah. check? Um, no, no, no. What do you, what do you feel about um, us approving? I guess I assume this would be the month of August if we did it. Um, for, for, I mean, I know you have to book out, so I don't know if that's difficult for you to, to agree to because we'd have to look at when the next select board meeting are. Oh, I think that's going to be, I, I, A, I want to say, uh, Chris and Leon, thank you for offering that because I, I think that helps forward the conversation. Mark, um, Mark, 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 hold yeah. on. We understand no is right. I mean, right. you're not, you're not going to book people right. outside in October. Um, um, I would just soon leave it like this. Can, Go ahead, Bill. You were going to say something? I was just going to say that I, I went out in the other room. The next select board meeting is after next week is September 8th, unless you have a special meeting. So if you come through, you know, through the first week of September, then you could reevaluate on the 8th. I, part of the issue they have is that, you know, if you make it through August 31st, Labor Day is late this year. There's two weeks between that and the next select board meeting. So instead of the month, would you be willing to go to like September 7th? Yeah, absolutely. And just, just revisit it. And everybody, you know, I'm sure everybody's going to work towards um, this thing, you know, working out for everybody. So I don't think, I don't see what we'll have a problem come September 8th, whatever it was you said. Yep. And I have to say, guys, I appreciate you guys contacting us about that special event. Can, can I make a suggestion that maybe this permit would be allowed to go through September, but we check in on the eighth select board meeting and they would know that, you know, the permit's potentially at risk if there are problems, but it doesn't require them to have to come and request extension on the 8th just because i'm sure no I, I i mean i have a music venue though so, and i know that you have to book months out sometimes maybe it's a little easier right now with covid but um do you have concerns if we said that you, we could only get you to september 7th would that make it difficult for you to plan september i mean what i would probably do here is i would plan out through september and then i would do my 
everything possible to keep, you know, he's everyone happy. And I think I can do that. And my expectation is, is that if you guys, you know, if there's any issues that I would hear about it and, and I, I really think that we can address it. And, you know, I'm hoping that I would before the select board meeting that I would know if there's an issue, but I, I really, I feel like, cause yeah, you got to, I mean, there's a, some shows I want to book, you know, September is like the last month I would have to book some music. So there's a few artists I'd love to get in there and, and book some shows. You know, if I screw it up or if we can't come to terms, I know that I have to keep, you know, everyone happy. So if, if uh, we can't do that, I know that I'm not going to be able to keep doing it. And so we're going to be on the line to make sure that we keep it contained and keep you guys. I, mean, happy. I, I don't have any problems. I mean, here's the way I look at it. Uh, unless there's unresolvable issues, uh, you know, there's no reason to to waste everybody's time. I mean, if the, if something could be drafted up that says, unless both parties just can't come to terms, um, this thing is good till the end of the year here, or, you know, yeah. the end of the weather. That's, for, weather that's what I'm thinking. Um, you know what I mean? You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I think we did the last permit contingent on select board continued approval. If there were any issues, I can't remember exactly what the wording was, Bill. I don't know if you could speak to that, but um, I, you know, I, I am completely, I'm unfortunately in the same business as you guys. So I'm sympathetic to understanding how bad that is. Like um, yeah. So I, I really appreciate um, your neighbors uh, looking to help you guys out. So I, I don't know if there's a select board member. I don't know if we need it. Have Bill tell us how to word it. If any select board member would want to make a motion, um, I think we could probably get there now. Yeah, if you want to make a motion to allow it through September 8th, I think I can write it such that the select board has the ability to revisit it if, if necessary. So uh, I think we're all understanding the general consensus, and Leanne and Chris are trying to be generous as much as they can but they want a little bit of a safety valve if something should go wrong. So if, if you make it through September, um, I think it can be written in such a way that makes everybody happy. And, uh, as I said, I haven't heard any complaints, so I think you'll probably be able to get through it, Noah. Sorry, it, it sounded like we were saying that maybe this could go, the approval would be past September, but we would just be checking in at select board meetings if there were okay. issues. That. That's what I'm going to say. Why can't we just have it through the end of October and at the next the September select board meeting, we'll just see an update on how it goes. And if it's going well, Maybe. I'm sure if you go to the end of October, that's going to cover. I don't think there's going to be too many outdoor concerts in November. Um, would any select board good. member like to make a motion? I agree with that. Yep. Um, I'll, ma I'll make a motion to allow uh, the Zen Barn to uh, hold outdoor uh, musical events uh, up to four nights a week uh, through through Octo October 31st uh, and to be reviewed upon at the September uh, select board meeting. Is there a second? Um, is there any further discussion? Uh, think, the only, uh, just a second, Mark. Um, is it all right with the select board? Because, you know, Nora and Ari both talked about indoor music, and they've offered that in the past. The only thing that spoke to indoor music in the past was their zoning permit. But as I stated at the last meeting, the, there is an entertainment permit and you're required, you know, Mark, your, your entertainment at the reservoir has always been indoor and you've needed to get an entertainment permit for it. So for the purposes of consistency, I would like to have the permit um, allow indoor music. It will have a condition that, the, you know, the doors have to be shut, just like the planning commission already said on the on the zoning permit or the DRB, I should say, and that the same decibel levels uh, that it's 60, 60 decibels at the 
at the property line. And then that way they're able to transition from outdoor to indoor without having any problem. And, you know, the indoor stuff, uh, I don't think there's been really any real problems with that in the past. So I'd like to just include it all in one permit if we can. I do we need to change the motion to amend my motion to include uh, indoor music through what was it through April 30th. April 30th. Second. Yeah. yeah, I can figure it out, Mark, in terms of writing it. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ari and Noah, for uh, working with your neighbors and uh, good luck with everything and hope you guys succeed again. I appreciate it, guys. And I didn't know about the entertainment permit, that $25. So I'm going to take the uh, three years we didn't pay and I'm going to chip it into those fancy $10,000 cross lock signs you're buying. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. You know. Sorry. You know. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, good night. Thanks, Chris. Um, Hip your music. Chris, I, Chris, I think your mic's working again. So if you want to take the meeting back over. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for filling in for me there. And I apologize for whatever happened. And uh, before we move on here, I'd like to ask Carla. Uh, Karen seemed to resolve the problem. What the heck was it? Hey. I felt you had two devices going they were too close to each other. So she shut one of them down. Huh. Two so basically devices. Leanne, I think maybe was also logged into Zoom and even though her mic was muted, the audio is picking up on your mic and creating this crazy echo. And so you usually kind of do Zoom meetings going with audio playing uh, or it makes that, that problem. I mean, we shut off everything there. Like our phones, our TV. So, We've got a resolve, so that's great. And I apologize for the mishap. Um, so the Rotary Club Entertainment Permit. Uh, anybody know what that's about? That, um, you brought to the table, Carla, or? Yeah, I have it here. Okay. Um, they're asking for live music similar to what they did the last time they asked for your permission. Um, they have three concerts, August 6th, August 13th, and August 20th that they usually do in the park, but they are in touch with either um, Pilgrim Park or Forest Field to do it there. Um, these concerts would be drive-in with masks, highly recommended, and social distancing in place for parking and sitting. I thought that I thought that uh, somebody from the Rotary Club would be on the on the call. Um, you know, August sixth is just three days from now, and they asked, as Carla said, to to do this. Um, they had asked to have concerts at Rusty Parker Park in July, and uh, that just was a no go. There was. You know, they were they were suggesting that they were going to limit the number of people, but you know there was no way you could keep people away from there. So um, we said no to that. The the EFUD commissioners, uh, and then they wrote a week or so ago and said, well, you know, we're not going to do anything at the park. We want to have it, but you know, I'm not sure what we're permitting now. We can. I, I don't think it hurts to do it, but. Uh, I would think that they would know by now if they're going to do it at Fires Field or at Silver Park if they're really going to do it. So I haven't heard anything from them for a while. So I don't know what to tell you. Um, who polls? Is, is there anybody from the Rotary that would, if they're having it down in Fires Field, Oh, they've had events there before. We ever had history of any any complaints or anything about late night music or anything like that? No, and this wouldn't be late. I think it's you know six to eight thirty or something like that. Yeah, it's seven to eight thirty. Okay. Yeah, it's it's really a, to mirror what they used to usually would do at the uh, 
gazebo in the Rusty Parker Park with the farmer's market on Thursday nights. But, uh, you know, we permitted it when they did, they had the, uh, you know, pull the trailer through the town and then they had a concert over at Pilgrim Park. Um, I didn't hear anything about it, whether it went well or not, but uh, I'm not sure where they're having this. So if you want to just permit it, I don't, I don't think it hurts to permit it, to say the select board gives them permission to do it. We'll contact them and say, and have it at either place as far as we're concerned, but. Uh, yeah, sure. As long as they've got a couple of designated places, we just don't want to give them a permit for wherever. Right. So, yeah, so if somebody would like to make a motion, then uh, Forest Field and what was the other place, Carla? Park. Somebody okay. just said in the chat that it's at Forest Field. Pilgrim Park. Oh, uh, let's make, let's let's make a motion. Ariel, who works in our office Ariel. and is in Rotary, and she Ariel. said Forest. Okay. okay. Well, did, we get the, did we get the times for this event? I'm sorry. 7 to 8.30 p.m. Well, somebody needs to make a motion then for uh, entertainment permit at Forest Field, the 6th, 13th, and 20th, between 7 and 8.30. Is that correct, Carla? Yes. Okay. So moved. All right. Second. Second. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, none. All those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, next on the item list is uh, Prohibition Pig on Street Seating Request. Is that another you, Carla? No, I saw Eric Warnstead on the call earlier, but he seems to have dropped off. Yeah. yeah, I think he was having phone issues. He texted me and said he was having some phone issues. I think Bill has some info on that. So, um, a week ago to a week ago today I got an email from a couple of residents complaining that the prohibition pig had uh, set up tables on the sidewalk on Main Street uh, not this past weekend but a week ago and the people complained that they were forced to you know walk around parked cars into Main Street to get where they were going so, I contacted Eric and I, and I told him, I said, you know, you don't have a permit. We've allowed, uh, you know, tents to be put up, outdoor seating to be expanded on your own property. Um, I said the select board did talk about potentially allowing you to use uh, Elm Street and some other considerations for Stowe Street, uh, given the construction and just traffic in general uh, having um, on you know having seating on Main Street seems impractical there, but I told him I said in in any regard, no matter where we're talking about, you can't set up tables on the sidewalk. We can't have pedestrians being forced to walk into the street to get where they're going. So um, he got back to me and said that he would you know be interested in potentially some on street. Um, use of the parking spaces on, on Elm Street. I asked him, I said, it would be helpful if you would send a little sketch, tell us how many places that you were thinking of uh, using, how many parking spaces, how many seats were you talking about? And then I reminded him that, you know, this is to uh, replace indoor seating, not supplement it. So in other words, I said, if, if you got a permit for a 60 seat restaurant, and you're going to put 20 seats out in the in the street. You can only have 40 inside. You 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 can only have 60 seats altogether. I didn't hear anything from him, and he was on tonight, as uh, Carla indicated. But he's not here anymore. So I don't know if he gave you any information, Mark. I I really don't know what to say beyond that. Yeah. We well we did talk about it a little bit. Um... I know that he said that those seats out front, his manager, they had talked about the idea of it and his manager just said it. So he wasn't direct. At it. He, he did apologize for, for doing it and had him removed right away. Um, I think, as everyone knows, uh, or probably does know, that the restaurant industry is having problems. Um, 
and part of it is what's happening with the rule book on social distancing which i think is the right thing to do but what it's creating is we, you can't seat any of your bar seating and he has the problem that he has very limited outdoor space i'm making almost all of my sales which i'm still off 40 to 50 percent with mostly outdoor seating he has that ability in the back but his front restaurant which is more of his business had no outdoor seating previously um i thought he mentioned to me that it was two parking spaces he was hoping for um i don't know if he was looking for anything more i did see him earlier in here i was hoping he would be here to tell us what he was looking for but um i know that he did mention that burlington has allowed him to do i believe two parking spaces in front of kind of the wood burlington because that also has the same problem he has outdoor seating on a, a regular basis and and that was one of the things they've been doing to try to help the industry um they actually built little parklets. They're like little platforms, which I know the construction might not allow for that. But um, I don't. I, I honestly don't know exactly what he was hoping to ask for without sketching. Well, but. Um, I guess a, a a possibility, and and I understand that there may be some reluctance to approve something that you don't really understand. But if the select board is generally um, uh, agreeable to allowing use of some parking spaces on Elm Street, you could authorize uh, you could you could authorize that permission to do that, uh, provided that uh, staff work out the details with him. And as I said before, you know we've got to be careful. There's there's water and wastewater allocations and, and the number of seats that he's able to have is supposed to be inclusive, whether it's inside or outside. Um, Steve's still on the call here. Um, and we'll have to work out with him, you know, is he trying to provide seating for the main restaurant? Um, how can he serve the main, if, he, if it is the main restaurant, is he able to provide service onto Elm Street? Evidently, he's using some of the space between the two buildings now for outdoor seating, Steve, right? Right. So we were out there uh, measuring for Garland um, a little over a week ago. And um, so there's the seating at the annex in the back on Elm Street um, that I think everybody has seen in their patio area between the sidewalk and the porch. And then they've added three or four tables, uh, wrought iron tables in the area between the annex and the building in the front, uh, mostly under the roof. So it has some cover from the weather. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, anything that might involve the parking spaces on Elm Street up next to the main building because of the proximity to the intersection and the activity with construction. I know uh, I've come out of there a couple of times and uh, I think there, there'd be a potential conflict if, if those spaces uh, would be used. So I think the spaces would have to be further back, uh, closer to the annex. So, um, you know, I haven't been any part of any conversations with Eric, so I can't speak to what he's looking for, but, um, I think we'd have to be pretty careful about how it would be laid out. Let me ask a couple of stupid questions. Um, I'm assuming two parking spaces also means the sidewalk well between the parking spaces and the restaurant? No. Oh, just the, the sidewalk. Parking. The sidewalk would have parking. to be just the parking, just in the street. The sidewalk stays open. So the server would have to come, you know, from the restaurant, cross the sidewalk, and then serve in the, in the street. Um, you really got to keep the, the sidewalk open. There's no way. No, that, you... that, that was why I asked the question. Um, yeah. Concerned that the sidewalk wouldn't stay open. Um, so does it, is, does it make any sense to, uh, with, the, with the village parking lot right next door there, uh, is that too far away from the restaurant or does it make sense to, rather than taking two parking spots on Elm Street, to give them two in that parking lot? Does that benefit them? Well, the, the parking lot has, 
I can't remember whether there's different time restrictions in the parking lot than there is on the street. We don't really enforce parking anyway. Um, and then that, you know, that parking lot is, it's the, it's EFUD's parking lot. So there's a different board involved. I think it's a little far away too, but um, especially if he's trying to service it from the front restaurant. I mean, how are people protected on, on the street like that? I mean, it, from possible action, vehicle driving by or something. Yeah, well, we'd have to talk about that. We'd have to, you know, probably put up some cones at the very least. And, and uh, you know, the tables should be close to the curb. Uh, there's a lot of issues. It's just, you know, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm kind of responding a little bit to the conversation that the select board had a couple of meetings ago and just trying to figure out a way if there's, if there's a way possible to help somebody to do some business, if right. we can help, I'd like to help. I'm not saying that we absolutely can do it, but uh, he's not on the phone now or not on the, on the computer now, so we can't ask him direct questions. So it's either we pass over it and say no and you know deal with it next Monday because we have a meeting on the 10th, or you can authorize staff to try to work it out. And if we think it's something that makes sense, allow us to do it. So it's really in your court at this point. So I don't want to sound too hypothetical here, but um, if we pass the permit, let's say pass the permit, give them two on street sites and some drunken fool runs over somebody while they're sitting there eating their meal, would the town be liable for that because we gave the permit? I can't say no. <laughs> I mean, whether, whether we're liable or not, I don't know, but could we be sued? Yeah, absolutely. It, you don't, there's no protection from lawsuits. You know, people can sue whoever they want. Okay. And, and you know, there's a risk. There's clearly a risk. So what's the board's pleasure? Sorry, I, I, I got disconnected. Um, I, I, I like the idea that we try to just have the town work with Eric and try to help him figure that out. I don't think we're going to run into any kind of problem with um, with seat count because you can't even see bar seating. I don't think that's going to change. And even if it does, the social distancing, he's lost at least half of the tables in the restaurant. So I don't think we're going to have a number, a number of seats problem. Um, he's also going to be combating weather because I doubt he's going to try to put a tent over this in the next couple of months. So I would make a motion that the town work with Prohibition Pig to allow up to three parking spaces. I looked on Google Maps and it looks like there might be three there next to the building. I think two isn't enough um, because you have to have six foot between parties. And I think a typical parking space is like 19 feet or 18 feet. Um, so I would say three spaces work with the town and uh, try to help them out and see if they can, we can do something for them. I second that motion. Okay, any further discussion? Can you, can whoever works with them, can they just update us on, you know, if that's how it goes and what was like the final outcome and whatnot? Ah. Uh. Yeah, I'm wondering if it makes sense to uh, try to work it out first, figure out what the what the uh, layout is, uh, and if Bill and Steve feel that you know it's as safe as it can be, um, then draft up something that says we're going to allow you to do this, uh, bring it for the bring it to the board at the next meeting for our signature, or is that easy to looking for something sooner? Or does that even make sense? I just know that we're running out of summer, um, like they alluded to and the other for Zen bar. And you probably, he's probably only got a month and a half of seating this, that maybe that's, maybe he's given up on the idea of even doing this or, you know, cause he's still late in the game on it. But I, I would suggest that we just approve it contingent on working it out with Bill and Steve and trusting that, 
you know, whatever they would have presented to us down the road at another meeting that, you know, we'll, we'll be to agree to it, but maybe we could put it contingent on if there's any reason somebody has a problem with it, we can bring it up in the next select board meeting, but allow them to at least get started and do something. Thanks for that. I agree with Mark. I think we need to way shape we can, and we just got to, you know, if, if they're going to, if, if Prohibition Pig's going to do something, they're going to want to act quickly. And let's get it done. If if the town officials, you know, have a problem with it, we could speak about that next week. That's fair. Alyssa, you have something to say? I was just echoing, I've hesitated on if to weigh in because I haven't spoke with Eric recently, but I had back at the end of June um, called Bill and sent him the information. I had spoken with the manager who had been interested on the Elm Street siding. So I just really applaud the approving it so that they have the options. And I do know it then in a follow-up had gotten to Barb and Woody talking and potentially there being some barricades that could also help support this. Um, so like I said, I just appreciate what you all are doing and totally respect the safety needs, but also think, um, unfortunately, it didn't all get packaged up well tonight, which is why, again, I was also going to defer to Eric, but this has been something they've been thinking about for over a month. And like it was said, there had been, I think, some other conversations too. Okay. Thank you. All right. The motion has been made and seconded. Uh, no, more cons no more discussion. Um, all those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. All righty. Last but not least, a couple items there of manager's items. Audit engagement letter is the first. Go ahead, Bill. You're muted. Bill, oh, you're muted. Uh, okay. I sent this out to you this afternoon. Uh, as I said, the, the audit is nearly complete. Uh, just in the transition from regular meetings to Zoom meetings because of COVID, uh, I just failed to get this before you. It's a standard engagement letter, spells out the scope of services and everything that the auditor is going to do. Um, the fee arrangement uh, is uh, $22,700. That's what we put in the budget this year because we had this information going into the year. So I would just ask the select board to approve the engagement letter and authorize me to sign it on behalf of the town. So moved. A second. You're muted, Chris. the right button so anyway somebody already second mark already seconded it so uh, we're off and running all those who wish to approve say aye aye aye, aye. thank you okay thanks bill uh, so the last thing on the item is uh nick extending the rec program yeah so nick is here um as i think you probably all know uh school has been Delayed till uh, September 8th, and um, I talked to Nick a week or so ago right after I heard about it, and Nick had already sprung into action and had already been working on a plan. So why don't you go ahead, Nick, and uh, tell him what we're talking about and what you'd like to do. Okay. Hey, guys. Um, so I sent the bill this afternoon and i think he sent it to you but it's just a one pager um going over the purpose of it it's basically summer camp um you know as it has been for the past eight weeks uh just just a smaller size due to staff availability um a lot of even though uh covid is very present in active day a lot of colleges are still accepting students back so we're losing a lot of our staff uh back to college um and then the ones that are staying home uh, and working remotely uh, and some of the, our high school staff that are a little bit uh, more mature, uh, we'll be running this camp. It'll, it'll host 44 kids um, instead of the original uh, 100 and what, like 125 that we were able to hold. Um, uh, they'll be at two locations, uh, Anderson and uh, Wesley. We got confirmation that we could use that church again. 
uh, for the additional two weeks. Um, outside of that, um, there isn't anything that's changed too much. Uh, we're going to charge $100 a week per resident um, and $150 for non-residents. Uh, and that uh, projected to it, it, no additional costs to the taxpayers. This, this two weeks will pay for itself. Any additional ability for new new kids? You full up? Um, I mean, what if what if some of the parents, for whatever reason, pull their kids at, at the end of the regular season? Um, how would you fill that void? Yeah. So I should have specified in the registration. So since it can only hold forty four kids. Uh, registration will open up like it does on town meeting day next monday at 7 p.m and it'll be like town meeting day first come first serve based on who's interested who gets the spot um i sent a survey out a week ago uh got a huge response back looks like it's going to be popular it's probably going to be wait listed um I, I i anticipate those 44 slots selling out very quickly got it <laughs> But if they don't sell out or if somebody leaves the program, you'll you'll probably have a waiting list and be able to fill that slot, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, the only downside from my perspective is that it's, you know, 44 kids. I think that, that the survey that uh, Nick sent out indicates there's probably more demand than that, but in such a short time frame, we we just don't have the ability to turn around and and hire additional staff to be able to take care of more than the 44 kids, and because you know locations are an issue, uh, you can only have what 25 students at a location anyway, or something like yeah. that. Yeah, 25 staff and kids. Right. So I think this is the the best that we can do on such short notice. Um, uh, I did feel it necessary to come before the select board just to make sure that, you know, you were on board with us uh, going forward with it. Our typical summer rec program is eight weeks and uh, there will still be one gap week, right? That we're not going right up to the day school opens. It's still going to be like normal where there'll be one week of nothing, right? Yeah. So staff's recommendation is to approve this, to allow us to, to implement what Nick has put together. Um, and, um, you know, because there, there's a demand for it, I think that, you know, we could sell more slots if we had more staff in more places, but we just don't have that luxury. So a motion needs to be made then to extend the rec program to the date, or is we need the date? Yeah, so for, for, two, for two additional weeks. Uh, Starting and ending. Uh, August 17th to the 28th to extend it those two weeks. I'd make that motion. We extend it to two weeks. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Are your are your staff trained in? Uh, yeah, they are. Oh, my wife said, yeah, they are. <laughs> I didn't know if you could get any, yeah. any kind of volunteers or whatever. <laughs> to, uh, no. to staff a little bit more. Background checks and all that need to be done. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Oh, so most of been made and seconded. Um, any further, if there's no further discussion, then we'll put it to bed. All those wish to approve, say aye. 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 <laughs> Pass it. And just a heads up, um, we're not prepared to go into the details tonight, but Nick will probably be back at next week's meeting for another exchange. Things that we might be trying to do into the fall, um, but we're not ready to talk about that yet. But you know, with with school only being in session with one day a week for each child, uh, you know, there's there's demand for um, 
for programming and, and care. We don't know yet how we can meet it or what we're gonna do, but Nick will probably be back next week with at least a conversation about what we might be able to do going forward. So uh, just a heads up. Yep, okay, I appreciate that. And anything else from anybody? I'll close it out. All right, well, I appreciate you all being uh, patient with me there through my <laughs> well, computer well. dilemma. Uh, I'll try to have my act together a little better next time. Mr. Technology. Oh, yeah, you know me, right? I'm good with a shovel in the ditch, but when it comes to this stuff, it's out of my league. So I'll take a motion to adjourn, and uh, we'll see you next time. Oh, so by, by the way, just a real quick comment. Did anyone get another one of those email things that have been coming around? The, the, you did, Nat? Nat you know, I, from, forget, I forget from whom. From but. Chris. Yeah, I got one that's yeah. pretending to be Chris or about an urgent matter. It's kind of getting out of control. Yeah, it must be I'm a pretty popular guy. Well, <laughs> I've, I've gotten exactly just, the just, same email from Almy, too. Yeah, just, yeah, say, just say no to all of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks for the warning, Mike. Okay. Take a, uh, the second on the motion there to adjourn. I'll second. All right. Adios. All those in favor, aye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Night, all. Bye.